Good morning, delegates. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to call this uh, meeting to order. Um, yesterday, I was here and I said I needed uh, that bring your neighbor. When we were closing yesterday's workshop, there was a little bit of space. But from what I can see now, even we needed more space. So thank you so much for coming in uh, these big numbers. I think this clearly tells us, the co-chairs and everyone, that nobody wants to be left behind in this process. And so we thank you for coming and keeping time. Being a weekend, you would have thought people could have come late. But really, everybody has been here. And we thank you for again waiting for us for the last about 15 minutes or so when we're trying to get organized. Um, this meeting, as most of you may be aware, is an outcome of the first uh, open-ended working group meeting which took place in Nairobi. And we were requested then to give uh, an overview of the preliminary zero draft of the post-2020 framework. So we are on time with that request, and that's why we are here. So before we could go any further, could I uh, call upon my co-chair if he has some other additional remarks to make? Good morning to all of you and welcome to Montreal. As uh, Francis said, we're very pleased to see not only so many of you, and we apologize for the uh, logistic uh, challenges. I see that chairs are being provided, and now the chair of Substar does have a chair indeed. So. <laughs> So, um, so we will be staying in this room. Uh, we, we've arranged a tree overflow room, A, C, and D. And I understand there is already about 50 people uh, taking advantage of that. So uh, please, if you feel a bit tired sitting on the floor, you, uh, you may have proper chair over there. Um, this is a very important meeting for all of us. Uh, we have prepared for that and, and hope uh, you will get the information you're looking for. We're equally looking for your comments and your input. Um, this meeting is being broadcast on YouTube and uh, when we get to the uh, question uh, session uh, later in the, in the, in the around, around one or two, uh, we will be taking questions from you but also uh, from uh, delegates that are taking it from YouTube. Um, we have been uh, busy going around and we've been many of you in thematic consultation or other meetings since uh, we met in, uh, in Nairobi and uh, you will see a lot of uh, various elements. Um, some of you will probably have seen some piece of what we presented today in various uh, instances, and, and, but perhaps some, it's the first time you see all of it, so we're looking forward to that. But uh, without any further ado, I think I'll pass the floor back to my co-chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, co-chair. Um, I would like now to take this opportunity to invite uh, Ms. Elizabeth Mrema the officer in charge of the secretariat to address the meeting. Ms. Elizabeth Morema, you have the floor. Thank you very much, co-chairs, and uh, indeed many thanks for all the delegates who have indeed read, be ready to spend their weekend with us and fill this room. It's indeed a major sign and evidence of commitment from all of us that this process is indeed important, and none of us wants to be left behind. We want to be part of the process, and that's why you are here. You like to contribute to the process, and that's why you are here. And the co-chairs, I'm sure you can rest assured that the delegates are ready for that. Given the strong determination to develop an ambitious, meaningful, inclusive, post-2020 global biodiversity framework using existing scientific and traditional knowledge to deepen our understanding about how to conserve, sustainably use, and ensure equitable access and benefits associated with biodiversity. I'm truly honored to be here today on this important landmark and milestone on our journey 
to really set the transformative agenda for biodiversity in the coming decades. As you may be aware, both our meetings this week and the last uh, weeks will play an important role in contributing to the preparations of the post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework, as well as in addressing the links between nature and culture. The working group on Article 8J had been busy last week discussing the contribution of traditional knowledge, innovation, and practices of indigenous knowledge and local communities with respect to the post-2020 framework. They made an excellent progress, took important steps, all intended to ensure that indigenous peoples and local communities are valued partners in this process of post-2020 uh, framework. Yesterday, thanks to IPBS and the co-chairs, and the team, the co-authors, also took their time to brief many of us on the evidence, the science coming out of uh, recent reports. We equally thank them for that because all this, again, contributes to that development of the framework. SABSTA 23 will begin its work this coming week to further inform science and technical evidence base for the post-2020 framework, including long-term goals, mission, targets, indicators, baselines, and monitoring framework. SBI 3, later next year, <coughs> will provide further guidance to the means of implementation again on the post-2020 uh, framework. The Secretariat, with close guidance of the, from the co-chairs of the open-ended working group, have completed the regional consultations in all five regions, with many also of thematic workshops and consultations already underway, some of them already taken place, and we will hear from the Secretariat staff as we move forward on the progress made in different areas today. All these meetings will be instrumental for our common understanding of trends, status, and the way forward, especially in support of the post-2020 framework. We are all aware that the first working group meeting held in Nairobi earlier this year. We are all preparing ourselves also for the second working group in February in China, with the third working group in Colombia in July. So indeed, none of us should be left behind. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to thank the co-chairs of the open-ended working group for your, their dedication to the post-2020 process and their time commitment to all of you parties, observers, stakeholders, for your continued interest and support, as well as the secretariat staff for their due diligence, or for their diligence and their hard work in supporting this process. Of course, I cannot forget our co-presidents with us to, again, help us in terms of guiding this process moving forward. To Mr. <coughs> Zedan, thank you very much. We appreciate your commitment because we indeed see where we want to head. With these few words, thank you very much. And again, good to see you all today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morema. I now hand over the floor to my co-chair. 
Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to invite the Secretariat to give us uh, some information on the use of the microphone. Jyoti, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a bit different from the plenary hall because you all don't have any flags. Um, so we have numbered each of the microphones. Um, the, when you press the microphone, the number will appear on our screen. And when the co-chairs call out to you, um, they'll call out a, a number and a green light will appear and then you may speak. I hope this works well. Thank you. Thank you. This complete agenda item number one. We'll now move to agenda item number two. Francis. Yes, to start with uh, agenda item number two, which is on the work plan overview, um, my co-chair and I will take some few minutes to make a presentation, then we'll continue from there on the progress. So uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I would like to give you a progress to date where we are uh, with this process, which is now close to 11 months, entering the 12th. Remember, we have got, we had 22 months. We have nearly taken a half of it. So let's see what has happened so far. But before we can say anything, there are those guiding principles which we agreed on parties agreed on at COP14. So as we do or carry out this process, we are very, very much um, cognizant of those 13 principles. And I think yesterday there were discussions on knowledge based. We had a lot of ideas on what transformative change could be. So as we go along with the process, that is what as the, uh, the co-chairs we keep referring to, whether we are, it is being followed. So go ahead. But you can get details in the COP decision, as I just said there. So we have, as part of the process, engaged uh, the, the substar and SBI chair, and my colleague will be uh, explaining a bit more on this, because these two bodies, plus the open and working group, need to work very closely together. And you're going to be hearing the roles that each one of them will be contributing. We have con uh, co completed some um, restoration, I mean, some thematic uh, workshops. We had the one on restoration. We have the one, just done one on marine and coastal biodiversity, and this will be, you will be hearing updates. Then the upcoming ones um, now include the area-based conservation measures, resource mobilization. Of course, for the area conservation measures, it's coming just slot shortly after uh, Substar, that is from uh, 1st to 3rd, uh, December 2019. Resource mobilization will come second week of uh, January, that is 14th to 16th, 2020. Capacity building, implementation monitoring and review, those ones will come just before we start the second meeting of this working group, the open air working group. So will be, they will be held in Kungmin. The same two capacity building also will take place just after that. Um, we have, of course, planned for sustainable use, and this is something that came very strongly during the first meeting of the Open Edge Working Group. And access and benefit sharing, this, that is the period so far. Could be March, April 2020. There are other uh, processes, biosafety, digital information and synergies, all this will be hearing much more about. Now, where are we in a summary? You can look at that graph. Again, we have presented this a number of times. But basically, to tell you, when you look at the gray area, I think we've done well on that. And uh, so the phase one was supposed to deal with the consultation. But in a way, consultation still continues uh, in this process. But that was the regional consultation we are talking about. And then phase two still also involves a bit of consultation which is now where we are beginning 
to work on the drafting. And now we have this informal briefing, which is taking place, as I said, as planned. So the good thing we'd like to really thank the Secretariat and all of you for supporting us in this process, because up to date, we've not yet postponed any date much significantly to, to affect the process. So we are holding this as planned. And then we have got um, this which I talked about, which will last for about six days, the second meeting of the working group. And then the last meeting should be in, uh, in July, that is in Cali, Colombia. Just to stay up front here that the negotiations will start at the open-ended working group too. And then we continue with the process. Go ahead. These are the other external processes that will feed into the post-2020. And um, we've talked about this a number of times, so I will not take a lot of uh, time on that. But they are very critical for us to take on board as we work on this uh, very important assignment. Could we go to the next one? As before I call my co-chair, I have to say this, that for the thematic consultations, the outcomes, the outcomes of that um, meeting, we are going to use it in drafting the framework. So consider those um, thematic consultations very seriously. Of course, each uh, thematic consultation is first accompanied by a concept paper, which tells you the scope and how it is going to be carried out. And also that we, as I said earlier, we link all this to SBI and Substa. Now we have got colleagues for these uh, thematic consultations. Our idea as the co-chairs is to really work with these colleagues up to the very end of the process because we didn't think it would be wise to keep doing everything, chairing from there, go and chair again thematic. You know, we would like to give opportunity for the other experts within us to participate fully in the process. So we have got colleagues for these thematic areas and uh, we'll see how we engage them up to the very end because they will be holding a lot of uh, you know, information and knowledge arising from that process. So maybe the next one is going to be my co-chair. Thank you, Francis. Um, following up on how we work and we engage with the other subsidiary body, um, the task is, is quite significant. And uh, it is clear to us that it is, would be impossible to do it without the help of all those that could help us. So the engagement of SEPSTA and SBI is, is key. And we've been working very closely with uh, the chair of those two subcommittees to define the way we work. So um, we will be uh, getting into some of the, the detail on that over the next coming slide, slides. Um, be for the uh, outcome of the open-ended working group, so uh, you have as you've seen in the, in the first one, it, there was reports. Now, this phase is nearly over. We're getting into open-ended working group two and three, which will be essentially negotiation session. So the outcome of those is new version of the draft. And we'll talk about that. Um, how are we gonna be managing that? Our commitment to you is to provide you with draft zero, the first draft on January 13, in all of the language. So that's six weeks in advance of the meeting in Kunmin. So we're working hard at uh, drafting that now in parallel of preparing for this and delivering this meeting here. We uh, are planning to issue another version after Open End Working Group 2, reflecting the, uh, what we heard at the Open End Working Group 2, and then another one in advance of Open End Working Group 3. We will seek your approval of the draft at the end of the meeting in Cali. And that will constitute what we will give to the Chinese presidency for the COP. Next slide. How are we gonna be arranging the document for open-ended working group two? So the green box is really the document you're gonna get on January 13. And it is a draft. There would be an intro, including the theory of change, there would be a vision, there would be the goal for 2050 a proposal for the mission, the, the 2030 goals, uh, and as many of the targets as we can, recognizing that some of the uh, thematic uh, consultation will not have been completed or just been completed. And then there would be an annex with a number of elements. 
that document will be supported by two other documents, and those are the blue box. One, there will be a glossary, which is our understanding of the definition of the various term used, and that's for you to, to, to use, and, and um, it's just, just the way we've been working. The second one is probably a relatively long document. We're talking about 50 to 70 page, which provide background information on each of the target proposal. And that's gonna be shaped in terms of a standard temp template with, for each uh, target. And that would provide tombstone information, uh, elements that we've taken from the best report from GBO5, from other scientific body, so where does that come from? The previous HE target. So all those are reference for you to look at. But your focus in terms of negotiation should be on the green box. Let's talk now about coordination and, and some of the advice. And this is an ongoing process. Uh, this morning we were in the bureau with Substa uh, hammering out the, the latest details on how we're gonna be working together. Uh, I first want to thank uh, Substa and SBI for their openness and the way they've been accommodating us. We come in with disrupting processes, not respecting any of the rules they've set and worked comfortably with for decades. And we're saying, well, then we're sorry, but that's, we have to do this in a very short period of time. And they've been very good at accommodating and understanding us. So basically at Substa 23, starting tomorrow, we are asking the SEPSTA to provide us from advice from a science perspective on the organization of the element, on the option for the mission, and the stepping stone toward uh, 2050, and then on the thematic area goals and targets. What I want to stress is our understanding of the process is that the role of SEPSTA is to provide us with good inputs from a science perspective. This is different from a negotiation. The negotiation will take place at Open Ended Working Group 2. What does that mean practically? What that means is that we're looking for elements, we're looking for coherence between what they see and what has been said in GBO5 and IBES. We're not looking at necessarily driving to a hard consensus around a specific number. And if there is disagreement or if there is various views, I think Substack can document that, explain us the rationale, and that is very useful to us. At Substack 24, it will be a different task. Remember, at Substack 24, we're past open-ended working group two. So hopefully we have started to have some discussion and we have the orientation of a package. Obviously that package is not final, there is one more meeting to go. But what we want from Substack is a validation is the direction of the package coherent, enabling realizing the vision for 2050? Does it address the issue identified in IPBES? Those are the kind of advice that we will be looking for at SUBSAT24. Next slide. Now turning our attention to SBI, and, and here we had meeting last week with uh, the chair of SBI and, and try to map out the process for various pieces, and there is a lot into SBI, and it's a bit different. You will see on the resource mobilization and financial mechanism that there is a number of process, and in a few minutes, Marcus, which I hope is here, will, uh, here, uh, he will uh, provide a much more eloquent elaboration of uh, this diagram, but essentially the diagram is the same one that appears in the scoping document. Various contribution from inside, the gray box are things that are coming from the outside and officially, and how that moved to SBI tree and eventually to open-ended working group tree. Capacity building, technical and scientific cooperation, and you can tell this is me typing because scientific is done in a funny way in a language that does not exist. But basically, uh, you have the same type of process driving to a discussion at agenda item on SBI tree and the negotiation. Transparency and responsibility is a very important item for many uh, parties, and they have been the subject of many discussion. Um, there is also some parallel process that I've not noted there, but really what we're looking at is there is the voluntary peer review trial and agenda item number nine on SBI, which eventually goes to an online consultation and eventually to negotiation. 
For AJ in Nagoya, there will be a review under, under SBI tree and, and moving to negotiation. For biosafety, we're told that this can move straight to open-ended working group tree, which, which is okay to us. Like we're very conscious of the workload on SBI and on the Secretariat. Mainstreaming, there's the advisory body uh, moving to agenda item 11 on negotiation. Sustainable use, or in the process of developing that agenda, but we expect that to uh, to probably uh, move directly to the negotiation. That completes the briefing on, on the overall briefing. We will now move to a series of very quick fire, three minute briefing from uh, various uh, people. We wanted you to to associate the the officer in charge of the Secretariat to this, uh, to this process. So Francis and I will move back to our, our chair and then we'll be calling on various in intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, co-chair. With that, um, I now take this opportunity to give the floor to David Cooper uh, to give us uh, an update on the ecosystem restoration thematic consultation. David, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, co-chair. Um, well, we only have three minutes, so we'll try and be very fast on this. We had a thematic workshop on ecosystem restoration on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework a few weeks ago in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, I'd like to thank the government of Brazil for hosting um, this workshop and for the Institute, the International Institute for Sustainability for uh, m most of the logistical preparations and uh, also much substantive preparation. And of course the, the workshop was um, was uh, led by uh, Eugenia Montezuma from Costa Rica and Nicola Breyer from, from, from Germany. Um, th there was also some two preparatory workshops uh, organized by the EU and by I IIS, uh, looking on the one hand at local um, approaches to ecosystem restoration and also um, looking at a new tool available to look at ecosystem restoration prioritization. The, uh, the, the thematic workshop itself had a high participation, um, some uh, 92 participants from 38 parties uh, and a lot of experts, a lot of organizations, trying to do two things really, to develop some ideas, some elements, not final text, but elements for what could be in a target on ecosystem restoration, and then also making some more general uh, points. Um, we only have, I only have another minute or and a half, so uh, this presentation will be on the website and will be available to you. I'll just highlight, um, if we go one more, uh, just a, f a few points here. And, and, and one very important point coming from this workshop was, if you're looking at areas in terms of ecosystem restoration, it really matters where the restoration takes place in terms of the benefits you might get for biodiversity, reducing extinction rates, um, uh, protecting uh, specific habitats and so on, or other benefits, environmental benefits, for example, climate mitigation or adaptation, uh, as well as socioeconomic benefits. So with the same area in terms of hectares, you could get a sevenfold difference in terms of biodiversity outcomes, for instance, depending on where that restoration takes place. So prioritization of areas, a really important thing to take into account as we move forward and, and consider targets uh, on this matter. And of course, that then has uh, implications for implementation, uh, for the um, means uh, uh, of implementation in terms of financial resources uh, and so on if we're going to get the maximum benefits from, from ecosystem uh, res restoration. One other key point was this was not just about forests, it's about all of the, the various uh, ecosystems. Uh, and finally, just to note this topic, of course, of particular resonance 
for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework as we enter the UN decade on ecosystem restoration uh, from 2021 to 2030. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. I'll now give the floor to Mr. Joseph Apiot to provide an update on marine and coastal biodiversity thematic consultation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Joe Appiot. I'm the coordinator for marine, coastal, and island biodiversity at the CBD Secretariat. I'm going to give a brief overview of the, uh, the thematic workshop on marine and coastal biodiversity that we held. Uh, maybe you can go back one that we held for the. Uh, no, there we go. That we held uh, just two weeks ago as input to this process. Uh, coordinated um, with the kind support of the, uh, the government of Sweden and, uh, and the Republic of Korea. So go to the next one. This was actually held as part of what we call 2020 Ocean Pathways Week um, and actually held a back to back and partially sort of overlapping with another meeting specifically focused on Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is on oceans and seas. So that provided some opportunity uh, from that initial meeting in the first two days, the first two and a half days, uh, to provide some insights on potential linkages and, and ways to learn some lessons from the SDG 14 process, of which there are many uh, overlaps and interlinkages, as, as we all know, with respect to the IGE targets. So we had, and we can go on to the next slide then. We had approximately around 100 participants. We're still finalizing the numbers. Um, but we did have uh, Mr. Basil Van Hav participating, as well as the co-leads for, for this workshop, uh, Ilham Mohammed from the Maldives and, and Adam Van Opsielen from, from New Zealand. Um, of course, uh, Ms. Marema was there and gave some inspiring opening words. But we also had the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson, present as well, again, to highlight opportunities and, and specific, specific opportunities and the importance of interlinkages between SDG 14 processes, also in light of the forthcoming uh, UN Ocean Conference to take place next year in 2020. On. Just to, I, I don't need to reiterate some of the, the more structural elements which are relatively consistent between the different workshops and have already been briefly noted by David, um, but just to highlight the issues that we discussed. Um, we had some initial briefing presentations uh, on, on the di diverse range of, of the status of, of marine and coastal biodiversity, including with, respects, with respect to those IG targets that are extremely extremely relevant to marine issues, uh, namely at target uh, 6, 10, and 11. Um, we also discussed, uh, as I noted a few times, the uh, interlinkages of SDG 14. We then coordinated um, focused discussions on around these specific thematic issues of relevance, uh, exploitation of, of, uh, not, uh, of, of living resources, marine pollution, important marine ecosystems, ecosystem restoration, area-based area planning and conservation, and threatened, endangered, and declining species. So we organized the, uh, the, the, the specific focused uh, discussions on potential elements for the post-2020 framework around those issues. But in that process, it was also, there was also some other additional issues that were noted as areas in need of further discussion that we delved into briefly but did not have time to actually get into great detail, um, those being climate, climate change and, and, and the ocean, uh, regional governance and regional approaches, marine spatial planning, and exploitation of non-living resources and the implications of biodiversity for that. So uh, we also held some webinars to prepare for this meeting um, and prepared a series of uh, background briefs, a compilation of background, background briefs on a range of these different issues. But some of the observations that we had at the meeting itself is that we had perspectives across different sectors. It certainly uh, wasn't solely uh, the, the conservation, so to speak, the conservation community only. We had participants from, from the fishery sector and from, from other who are also involved and engaged in other relevant sectors. We heard during the, during the discussions about uh, the observations pushing towards the need for the less, uh, less uh, siloing, so to speak, of, of marine issues or marine, uh, marine targets and understanding of how marine issues uh, are, are cross-cutting across a range of different considerations and work of the convention. And what's important to note is that this discussion, the discussions of the workshop focus not only on conservation issues but also sustainable use and aspects related to uh, sustainable economic growth, uh, social well-being and equity. Um, the the uh, the discussion actually reflected a lot of the observations on lessons learned from the IG targets. Um, and there was much discussion on, key, on, on what we need to do better, how, what, what we haven't done well in terms of the IG targets in, in the marine and coastal realm. 
Um, there were a number of, of elements for potential targets that were brought forward and, and information and insights that will be very useful to actually formulate, to, to, to provide, um, provide insights to the OEWG process and the co-chairs in, in their work in, in further developing the process, but uh, not, not as much a specific proposed target language, but nonetheless uh, significant, um, significant insights and, and, and information and views brought forward on, on, um, on areas that can inform the development of, of, of the framework with, with respect to marine biodiversity. So, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I now give the floor to Mr. Hamdala Zidane to provide an update on the IPLC Global Dialogue and the 11th meeting of the Working Group on Article 8J. Uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, distinguished delegates, I am pleased to report to you on the outcomes of the 11th meeting of the Working Group on Article 8J, which concluded after three days meeting last week. The Working Group on Article AJ concluded last Friday with very good results. Most importantly, a clear process was agreed for the development and elaboration of a new program of work on traditional knowledge and an expanded role for indigenous peoples and local communities as on-the-ground partners in the implementation of the convention post-2020. Frankly, I would have liked to see more ambition and the program of work elaborated sooner rather than later, but it was not possible. The indigenous peoples and local communities seem to agree with the proposed time frame for the development of the program of work. The working group will finalize its new program of work and provide advice on institutional arrangements for the effective participation of local, of international, of indigenous peoples and local communities in the work and implementation of the global biodiversity framework post-2020 in the light of adoption of the global biodiversity framework and an ad hoc technical expert group meeting on indigenous peoples and local communities and post-2020 global biodiversity framework at its 12th meeting in 2021 after COP15. An annex of possible elements of work will be peer-reviewed in 2020 to assist its further refinement at the expert meeting. The working group on Article AJ also considered possible elements of work on the links between nature and culture in the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. This agenda item will be also considered by Substat 23 uh, next week. This particular agenda item was well received by the participants at the working group. The theme of nature and cultures is an inclusive whole of society approach that seems to resonate with many and had wide spirit support last week at the working group. One of the foci of this work is to create an interagency mechanism, bringing together entities working with nature, with those working on culture, and international alliance for nature and culture, bringing together the CBD, UNESCO, IUCN, and indigenous peoples and local communities and other partners to ensure enhanced integration of biological and cultural diversity, nature and culture for humanities, the vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. On the basis of the information contained in a note prepared by the executive secretary, the working group on Article AG prepared last week a recommendation for consideration by the Conference of the Parties at its 15th meeting in Kunming. Uh, given Substa busy agenda, Substa may wish to take note of the recommendations to the Conference of the Parties prepared by ATOC, by the open-ended working group on Article 8G. Additionally, the meeting of the working group considered under its agenda item 
on in-depth dialogue, the contributions of the traditional knowledge, innovations, and the practices of indigenous people and local communities, and the cultural diversity to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Along with an interim progress report, this in-depth dialogue provided the working group with some food for thought in thinking about future work. Given the importance of language diversity and indigenous and local languages as vehicles for the intergenerational transmission of traditional knowledge and acknowledging that 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages, the working group decided to take up the role of languages in the intergenerational transmission of traditional knowledge, innovations, and practices and the topic for the in-depth dialogue at its next meeting. Additionally, the working group considered an interim progress report, which noted the increasing visibility of the indigenous peoples and local communities in the national reports, but also called for more substantive actions, inclusive of the collective and the local actions of the indigenous people and the local communities for the goals of the convention. Finally, the work group also considered recommendations of the United Nations Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues on the contributions of indigenous peoples to the management of ecosystems and the protection of biodiversity and a set of actions and commitments in relation to conservation and the human rights in the context of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. I'm also pleased to report to you that prior to the 11th meeting of the working group in Article AJ last week, the Secretariat organized, thanks to the generosity of the Government of Canada, the Global Thematic Dialogue for Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities, and the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework on the 17th and 18th of November with 55 indigenous people and the local communities participants. The report was made available to the open-ended working group in Article AJ and related provisions, recommended that the co-chairs of the open-ended working group on post-2020 global biodiversity framework take note of the outcomes of the global thematic dialogue in the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I recommend the report of the dialogue and particularly its annex to you as containing a sort of conceptual advice you have been looking for concerning integration of indigenous people and the local communities and harnessing the power of their collection and the local actions for the goals of the convention in order to reach our vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. The report will be also made available for the consideration of the second meeting of the working group on post-2020 global biodiversity framework when it meets next February in Kunming, China. I look forward to continuing to work with you, representing the Egyptian presidency of the Conference of the Parties, as we move rapidly toward this, our objective of preparing a global biodiversity framework by October 2020 for adoption at COP15. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Zidane. I now hand over the microphone to my co-chair. Thank you. <coughs> we'll now turn our attention to sub-item B, which is debrief on upcoming process under the work plan. And we will begin by inviting the chair of SEPSTA and the chair of SBI to provide us with update on their respective body. We now give the floor to uh, Dr. Ezekiel benitez Diaz, chair of uh, SEPSTA. Ezekiel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Co-Chair, and good morning to <coughs> everybody. As already mentioned by Co-Chairs, SUBSA has been requested 
by the Open-Ended Working Group on Post-2020 to provide elements concerning guidance on the specific long-term goals, the mission, targets, indicators, baselines, and monitoring frameworks related to drivers of biodiversity loss. So it's important to know that this is focused on biodiversity loss for achieving transformational change within the scope of the three objectives of the convention. So tomorrow you will see in agenda item three that we prepare, you will, you will find a paper for consideration by this substa, which is addendum four online on the CBD website. Also, at SUBSA 24, we will be validating targets that had been discussed during the second meeting of the open-ended working group in coming in February 2020, and also to support uh, the third meeting of the open-ended working group in Cali. Uh, we have a very good coordination with co-chairs and substance, also the Bureau, you join us this morning. And uh, I have assured the co-chairs that on, the, on this process, uh, that request coming from the open-ended working group will be accommodated and handled in the most efficient way as possible. In addition, I will work with my fellow chairs and the secretariat to streamline documents in order to minimize the workload of parties and the secretariat as presented already on the timeline. We, uh, so so we are doing our best. As you know, as you already said in your introductory remarks, it's not following the usual practice and, and procedures of SUBSTA due to the natural li time limitations, but we are we're doing our best to contribute to the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Ms. Charlotte Sarquist, Chair of SBI. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, and good morning to all colleagues. The third meeting of a subsidiary body of implementation will consider important means of implementation that will have an impact of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. These include as you've seen already at the at, um, presentation of the, our co-chairs, resource mobilization, capacity building, as well as proposal to review, renew, and strengthen technical and scientific cooperation, knowledge management, communications, coordination and coherence with our organizations, and also Katarina Protocol and Nagoya Protocol considerations. Monitoring, reporting, and review mechanisms will also be discussed at SBI 3, including an open forum where a party-led review process mechanism will be tested during SBI with a view to provide recommendations to a post-2020 process. And in addition, the first meeting of the Open Annual Working Group in Nairobi also requested the informal advisory group on mainstreaming to provide concrete recommendations to SBI free for their consideration and further recommendations. As my fellow chair from Substar just said, we have a good, good corporations, good corporation with our co-chairs, and we try to work together as good to help each other. Uh, and I have assured the co-chairs that any request coming from the open and working group on the post-2020 process will be accommodated and handled in the most efficient way possible. And in addition, I will work with my fellow chairs and the secretariat to streamline documents in order to minimize the workload of parties and the secretariat. So we will do our best to contribute to this important process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte, and I must underline the, uh, the work that both committees are doing in terms of uh, streamlining document and making sure we're prioritizing the work of parties and the work of the Secretariat to be as, as, as efficient as possible. That's much welcome. Uh, distinguished delegates, we will now like to invite representatives from the Secretariat to provide us with uh, very quick updates on process. Uh, we'll now give the floor to Mr. Sarat Babukida to provide an update on area-based conservation measures that will be followed by Marcus Lenham. Sarat, the floor is yours. Thank you, 
It's working now. Thank you, Chair. Some of you may be knowing me because as Archbishop Target 11, every fortnightly I deliver sermons and preachings. So definitely some of you might be reaching out. Now, IG Target 11 talks about protected areas and other effect to area-based conservation measures. Now, we want to have this thematic consultation on area-based conservation measures. Some of you asked, what, what is this? What is a protected area? What is affected area-based conservation measures? Now we have the ABCMs. But ABCMs are really nothing but any site-based area-based conservation measures. So collectively, protected and OECMs and any other area-based conservation measures will include ABCMs. Now the important aspect is we are not simply developing a target in post-2020 for ABCMs. The objective is we want to achieve the 2050 vision through area-based conservation measures for a target in post-2020, right? So with this, I really do, because I have only three minutes time. When I start talking about protected areas, I talk a lot, everybody says. So I have to restrict myself less than three minutes. Already one minute is over. The next thing, next slide, right. I don't want to go in details into the object too, but one thing I want to really remind all of you is, the thematic consultations or the workshops are meant for providing practical inputs to the co-chairs so that they can develop a plausible text for the, for the benefit of the negotiations for developing the smart targets. So let us really try to understand this. This is very important. All of us, when we see a, a group photo, first we see where, where, where I am. Where are my friends? I don't really get the ensemble. So don't try to really push your respective agendas, but within the context of reaching the 2050 vision, what is needed for us? So for this purpose, the objective as set in the concept note, I'm not going to read it, but the two co-leads co for this workshop are Stephen Liner from the European Union and Mary from the Seychelles. I think Mary is here. Next slide, please. Now, it's very important because considerations, the considerations, what we have to deal with is, it is not a negotiating meeting. All of us collectively coming together, we have to identify the issue, identify the best ways and means to unravel the problems. This is very important. Please try to really stick on to this. The second thing is, we have 2010 target. We did not achieve. We have 2020 IT targets. So what experience we really gained from them? What is needed for actually for implementation on the ground? Not simply science-based things. So many publications in the last two years, more than 26 we have included in, the, in a compilation, su suggesting 40%, 50% of Earth, the deal for nature, 40%, etc. But where it is? So all these things we have to consider it. But the most important, the last one is about the integrated nature. Like the target level elements, all elements of the 2050 vision are integrated. They are not in isolation. If you see 2050 vision, by 2050, biodiversity is valued, conjured, widely used. And for, for ecosystem services, for the sustainability of the planet, and the well-being, and all, and all benefits to us. So what does this really mean? Action in one element have implications for other elements. Because I can see Trevor here, I'm not simply pushing the 17%, 10%. That 10% and 17% have implications for ecological representativity. It is important for biodiversity the governance, equity, etc. So try to understand how action in one element have implications for the other element. This is, this is very important. Next slide, please. Of course, I don't want to go a deal with it, but we have more than 100 experts, and we have still prepared three wonderful background documents available on the web. One is, the first background document is about the real background. What is the issue? What is the ABCM? What is the difference between the ABCM and the, and the protected areas? How the ABCMs have implications for 2050 vision, etc. But the second one is very important. In the last two years, more than 28 publications in nature, science, PNAS, wonderful, very elite scientific journals, suggesting so many things. So I really captured it, and we put them in the summary of this thing. The third one is what you have already given in, the, in your submissions. What kind of a target? Next. No, skip it. The last one. 
Because if we really don't know what we don't know, we can never achieve. And I think my, my mentor and the former boss, Bravilio, is here. I made his life miserable, not only during his tenure in the Secretariat, even for the last two and a half years after he demit the office. On 23rd of August, he made, he, he made a suggestion. Sarath, if you want to understand how much biodiversity is needed for conserving the species, how much biodiversity is needed for achieving the food security, how much biodiversity is needed for achieving the climate security or social, ecological, and economic security. First of all, we should understand what we have, and then what is the gap, and what for we want. So the first question what he asked me is, why and what for? So we are not developing the post-2020 or, or a target for the ABCMs or the biodiversity. We are developing a target for achieving the 2050 vision, which is nothing but ecological, economic, and social securities of the goals of the world or the nations. So how much we needed for conservation for the species? Is it only very highly important species, charismatic species, or, or any species? Or how to conserve the ecosystem services? So these are the questions which we have to unravel. And I told you, because this is iterative process. It's not negotiating. I have a wonderful partnership people for the target 11, you may be knowing. So all these people will have you here unravel the issue in, a, in an iterative manner, identify the issue, then find out what is the most plausible thing. It is not purely based upon science. Or try to understand the science plus the practicalities of implementation on the ground. This is very, very important. So the first question what we ask it is, why, what for? Then the second question is where? Anywhere, I have 17% and 10%. By achieving the 17%, 10%, really, really, I, I really addressed where? I really don't know. Then, how much I need? 40%, 50%, 100%? What is that? Then, the most important thing is how to really achieve them. Because I say, people say that there are seven elements, quantitative and qualitative. We did not achieve the qualitative elements. So what is the relation between quantity and quality? So then, most importantly, is how I can measure and how I can really report. These are the very important issues. The second thing is, is it a one target or a set of target at the global level based upon the national level experience? Sorry. Sorry. So that's all. You can read it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarat, and we're blessed to have your dedication working for us. Now, for a different type of presentation, Marcus, you have three minutes, and I know you will stick to three minutes. Thank you, Co-Chair, and good morning, everyone. Now, on biodiversity mainstreaming, uh, you will recall that uh, COP established an informal advisory group to support the Secretary in further developing a long-term strategic approach to mainstreaming and uh, to advise on how to appropriately reflect this important topic of mainstreaming in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Now, the uh, informal advisory group, or IAC, uh, consists of 15 government-nominated experts and 15 experts from relevant organizations and initiatives, as well as stakeholder organizations. It is now fully operational and has started its work, specifically based on initial deliberations and a brainstorming in the group. Uh, the Secretariat prepared a draft wireframe of the long-term approach. This draft wireframe, a skeleton structure, if you may, was further discussed by, by the IAC in a teleconference in early October. <laughs> and there is seemingly agreement in the work in that the wireframe, with some adjustments, uh, was acceptable as a basis for its further work. Uh, many group members provided written comments subsequently, based on which we as Secretariat are currently preparing a first draft of the uh, approach for further discussion by the group. Um, 
after this future discussion and as, as agreeable by the group, uh, the draft will also be shared with the Bureau as requested by the COP decision, um, as well as also for further input and feedback uh, with a broader network of partner um, and that feedback by the broader network will then also further discussed by the group in revising the draft. Now, the planned further discussions of the group on this first draft will take place both electronically and uh, possi possibly also at a physical meeting of the group in the second half of next January, January 2020. Uh, the feasibility and modalities of that meeting are currently under exploration. The further work on the long-term strategic approach will eventually lead to the uh, requested advice on how to appropriately reflect biodiversity mainstreaming in the post-2020 uh, framework itself, including concrete proposals thereon, as has been invited by the first meeting of the Open-Ended Working Group. And this will be included in the report of the IAC to the uh, subsidiary body on implementation at its third meeting. Um, we will provide an update of the work of the IAC and our work on mainstreaming at the second meeting of the Open-Ended Working Group. Um, on resource mobilization, you will recall that the COP called upon the Secretariat to contract a panel of experts uh, to undertake technical work to support the parties in, in, in develop that critical component. Uh, the work, the mandate of this panel of experts is spelled out in paragraph 15 of the COP decision. Um, and I am pleased to uh, report, and as also was also communicated in a notification on 7th of November, I'm pleased to report that the experts on resource mobilization are now on board due to the financial uh, support from the government of Germany, and they are actually here with us. Um, so I would like to quickly present them to you so that you can put a face to a name. Uh, they will also reach out to, to, to many of you, hopefully in the next days, to deliver their mandate, which is basically to collect experiences uh, with uh, IG Biodiversity Target 20 and the strategy for resource mobilization. Now, we have first, uh, in no particular order. Uh, Mr. Jeremy Apple from the United Kingdom. Um, he will, in the panel, uh, primarily be responsible for the delivery of the review of experiences and evaluation of IG Biodiversity Target 20 and the current strategy for resource mobilization. Uh, then we have Mr. Yasha Pfefferholz from the EcoHealth Alliance. Uh, whose primary responsibility in the team will be the financial needs assessment, the assessment of the financial needs to implement the post-2020 framework. And we have uh, Mr. Tr Mrs. Tracy Cumming uh, from the Republic of South Africa, whose primary responsibility will be the contribution of the panel towards the new resource mobilization component. Uh, quickly to note that the composition of the panel complies with the request of COP to achieve geographical balance between developed and developing countries and to have one expert from civil society organizations. And I also wish to note that in the light of the substantial overlap and potential for synergy, Mr. Pfefferholz will also become a member of the panel of experts task with the assessment of financial needs for the eighth replenishment of the Jeff Trust Fund as per decision 1423 on the financial mechanism. The other members of that panel are currently being recruited with the kind financial support of the government of Sweden. As I mentioned, the panel members will reach out to parties and stakeholders on an informal and bilateral basis, including as to get a first sample over the next days uh, in order to collect views and experiences with the current resource mobilization component. Um, I also wish to recall that uh, the notification on 8th of October called for the submission of uh, pertinent evidence based on these different tasks uh, requested from the uh, panel of experts in the COP decision, and your input by end of this month will be appreciated to support the, the further work of the panel. 
Now a few words on uh, the up directly upcoming work and the workshop. Uh, the, the, the experts are focusing their work now on the review of experiences and evaluation, including the identification of gaps and the need for appropriate action. Uh, a first draft of this analysis will provide a basis for consultations among parties and experts at the thematic workshop, which is planned uh, 14th to 16th January 2020 in uh, Berlin, Germany, and with the kind uh, financial support provided by uh, the government of Germany. Um, I should perhaps mention that the experts uh, were also participating in uh, a number of uh, workshops organized by uh, partner organizations um, to support that process, uh, the, namely the sub-regional workshops for African countries, which were organized by GIZ, so funded uh, by the government of Germany, uh, just in the last two weeks, as well as the uh, workshop organized by the World Bank, uh, together with the government of China, the incoming presidency. Uh, that workshop took place um, three weeks ago in Beijing and focused specifically on harnessing private sector finance for biodiversity. The experts are also on, uh, in, in, in contact already with the uh, different uh, work processes and the associated uh, partner organization leading these work processes on different economic and finance matters that were alluded to by the coaches in uh, their, their earlier report. Um, back to the workshop. Uh, the Secretariat is currently developing the proposed workshop for the workshop based on the concept note of the co-chairs and in consultation with the co-leads on resource realization who are uh, Mrs. Ines Valet from Belgium and Mrs. Luciana Melchert from Brazil. And we'll also consult, of course, with the pa expert panel, as well as relevant international partner organizations and initiatives. Now, the workshop is expected to provide concrete proposals for further consideration by uh, the open-ended working group at its second meeting, and then subsequently uh, by at SBI 3. Um, in addition, the outcomes of the second meeting of the open-ended working group, and then, of course, including any specific additional guidance uh, from, from parties, uh, the outcomes are expected to also form the basis for the further work of the experts on their other tasks, namely to uh, develop the financial needs assessment and in further developing its contribution to the further resource mobilization component for eventual consideration by SPI 3 and then subsequently by uh, the open-ended working group at its third meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I will now pass the floor to uh, Mr. Eric Tamali, who will talk about capacity building, technical and scientific co co cooperation followed by my Ms. Nadine Saad. But before doing so, I just want to recognize the presence of a former executive secretary, Mr. Braulio Diaz, who is trying to hide at the back there. Welcome, Braulio. <laughs> Eric, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Or oh, is it already good afternoon? <laughs> Good morning. So um, just briefly in three minutes to give you an overview with regard to the, uh, the thematic consultation on capacity building and technical and certificate cooperation, which will take place on the 1st of March. Um, this is um, drawing from the mandate given by COP13 and COP14 to prepare a draft long-term strategic framework for capacity building beyond 2020. I'd also uh, propose those uh, requests at the last COP to prepare proposals to review and strengthen technical and scientific cooperation in support of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. 
As part of these decisions, uh, uh, the, the executive secretary was requested to commission a study that would provide the knowledge base for the preparation of the, uh, the long-term framework for capacity building, and also to organize uh, um, regional and uh, stakeholder-specific stakeholder consultations uh, on the online forums to enable input from parties and stakeholders in the preparation of the framework. So, um, will the long-term um, um, framework will be informed by a number of processes, um, uh, including the study, as I've mentioned. The study has already been um, uh, commissioned, um, and UNFWCMC is undertaking this study for us. And we hope to get the, the report at the end of this month, which is an, um, uh, this week. Um, in the meantime, also we are consulting with different uh, uh, players to provide input into the elements of the draft uh, framework. Uh, so far, we've um, uh, interfaced with the liaison group on, on the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, uh, which met in uh, October, and also the Advisory Committee on Capacity Building for the Nagoya Protocol, which also met in October. So we've interfaced with these two groups and sought some views on possible elements of the uh, long-term framework. During this um, the 8J meeting, we had a, uh, a side event, and this week on Friday we'll have another side event on capacity building, again to seek views on possible elements on uh, of the long-term framework on capacity building. Um, then all these. Uh, we'll prepare the draft elements, uh, which will be subjected to online consultations. Um, uh, we'll have a forum, online forum, in the month of January uh, to, again, to seek more views uh, from different from parties and different stakeholders and prepare a draft that will go uh, to the global th uh, thematic consultation uh, on March 1. And then on the basis of these um, uh, views, um, um, first of all, the objectives of the, 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 the thematic consultation will be to review the draft elements that we will have prepared, um, and also the proposals for strengthening technical and scientific cooperation. But as most of you are, know, are already aware, the, on the technical and scientific cooperation, we have an item on this agenda, on the Substar uh, 23, which will be already considering draft elements, um, draft proposals for strengthening technical and scientific cooperation. And all these will be packaged and shared at the global consultation. The second objective of the global consultation will be to identify strategies and mechanisms to foster greater synergies and cooperation with other international processes um, and revenging those existing processes to strengthen capacity building uh, for the uh, supporting the post-2020 global value framework. Um, we hope uh, after the global consultation, um, we'll prepare a reverse version of the draft elements, uh, which will be subjected to further online consultations uh, to find to and then prepare the draft framework, long-term framework that will go to SBI three. Um, the the COP mandated us to submit this to SBI three, so we hope then we'll have a draft. That will be, this time it will not be draft elements per se, but rather a complete set of all the elements emerging from all these uh, pre consultations and have a draft that will be um, uh, considered by uh, ISBI 3. And, and I guess the third open ended working group in, in July. And eventually everything will go to COP. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I will now ask to Madame Nadinsa to, uh, to present. Nadine, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. Um, so the topic of review mechanisms, um, like the title suggests, s sort of, um, it implies the whole planning cycle as it relates to the convention. So it includes planning, implementation, monitoring, reporting, and review. So you will see all sorts of shorthand, transparency, accountability, review, reporting. Um, just rest assured that we're dealing, as we've been recommended by you, to deal with all of these issues in this, um, review, in this thematic stream. The mandates for this stream come from decisions 14, 27, 29, and of course, 34. Um, as our co-chairs have suggested, 
The formal negotiation of this item or this topic will take place in open-ended working group three. Before that, however, the Secretariat in guide, with the guidance of the co-chairs have planned a thematic consultation, which will pay, take place right before the second meeting of the open-ended working group on the 21st and 22nd of February in Kunming. A notification has already been sent out for that along with the notification for the open-ended working group. Um, the thematic consultation will discuss options for an enhanced review mechanism. Um, it will consider existing measures under the convention, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, existing measures under other processes, both within the UN and outside the UN, and their strengths and, and, and weakness, their possible contributions um, to our process in the convention. Um, input from this will go to SBI 3 and to the open-ended working group. In addition to that, we will have an expert workshop. Um, the timing is to be confirmed, but it, we're looking at March, possibly very early April. Um, and this will help to further elaborate pending issues after the thematic consultation. Now, SBI will also play a key role in this process. Firstly, it will, it will test a party-led process through an open-ended forum during its agenda and the SBI can recommend, um, make recommendations basically to the third uh, meeting of the Open Ended Working Group um, after this. And secondly, SBI will also consider a report on options to enhance review mechanisms with, with a view to strengthening implementation of the convention. This will also feed into the process of um, the Open Ended Working Group 3 and eventually COP15. To close, I'd just like to tell you who are the brave souls who have decided to help us in this process as co-leads. So we have Rosemary Patterson from New Zealand and Mr. Alfred Otengebo from Ghana. And I'd like to thank you guys very much for volunteering and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, our last Mr. Peter Dortman. Uh, to provide us an update on biosafety, uh, followed by uh, work with Damena Yifu. Peter. Good morning. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving us an opportunity to report on um, some processes that have been taking place uh, on biosafety. The uh, conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Cartagena Protocol uh, on biosafety in its decision CP97 noted the preparatory process for the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and welcomed COP decision 1434. The meeting of the parties to the Cartagena Protocol stressed the importance of including biosafety in the global uh, biodiversity uh, framework. It also developed, uh, decided to develop a specific implementation plan for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety that will be anchored in and complementary to the post-2020 framework. The uh, meeting of the parties set out a process for the development of the biosafety component of the post-2020 framework. It invited the submission of views and requested the liaison group on the Cartagena Protocol to contribute to the development of the relevant elements of the biosafety components of the post-2020 framework. A global consultation workshop on the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, Biosafety and the Cartagena Protocol was organized to facilitate a discussion on biosafety within the post-2020 framework. The global consultation was held in Nairobi immediately prior to the first meeting of the open-ended working group on the 25th of August uh, earlier this year. During the global consultation, participants discussed, among others, possible specific biosafety elements uh, for the post-2020 global uh, framework and biosafety as it relates to other issues and thematic areas that may be included in the post-2020 framework. In October of this year, last month, the liaison group on the Cartagena Protocol held its 13th meeting where it developed a draft of the biosafety components of the post-2020 framework. 
taking into consideration the views that had been submitted and the outcomes of the global consultation. The draft biosafety component comprises a target, sub-targets, and indicators. The draft biosafety component of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework has been communicated to the co-chairs of the open-ended working group to enable the co-chairs to take this draft into consideration when developing the zero draft of the post-2020 framework. The text is also contained in the report of the meeting of the liaison group, which will be available shortly. Considering the reference to biosafety in the convention, in particular in its articles 8G and 19, the liaison group was of the view that the biosafety target should not be limited to issues under the Cartagena protocol only, but should address biosafety more broadly. The liaison group noted that the biosafety component should also address synthetic biology and other emerging genetic uh, technologies, especially considering the time span of the framework and the rapid developments in technology. The liaison group at its 14th meeting to be held in April 2020 would be available to provide further feedback to the development of the biosafety component as required. In parallel to this process, a specific post-2020 implementation plan and a capacity building action plan for the Cartagena protocol are being developed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Warku Damena Yifru, uh, can you provide us an update on uh, digital sequencing information followed by access and benefit sharing? Thank you. Here we go. Um, yeah, all the presenters from the Secretariat, are, most of us are the male. And you can, and there's no gender balance, as you have noticed, uh, simply because uh, our senior uh, officers, uh, uh, women officers, they have left us. Uh, that's, that's why I'm here, for example. Uh, I'm in charge now of uh, ABS unit. That's why Peter, who you just heard, uh, was here, because uh, Manuela left us. Um, that's why here you have seen Joe appear uh, representing uh, the marine um, the program area. Yeah, it's just an observation. But let me go now back. No, let me go back to my main job. So it's now digital sequence information because I, I have two items. Okay, yes. Um, as you, uh, most of you know well, uh, the issue of digital sequence information on genetic resources uh, was considered by the uh, 14th meeting of the COP and the third meeting of the COP MOP of the Nagoya Protocol, and both of them took decisions. Uh, the, 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 the main decision, the substantive decision, was taken by the COP, and that decision was endorsed by uh, the decision uh, of the COP MOP of the Nagoya Protocol. In its decision, uh, uh, the COP has established a process uh, to facilitate considerations of uh, potential implications of the use of digital sequence information on genetic resources for the objectives of the convention and the protocol. The process includes the submission of views and information and the commissioning of science-based and peer-reviewed four different but interrelated studies. The period for submission of the views and information is now closed, as you may know, and the studies are also complete, at least the, the first draft of the studies were submitted to the Secretariat and by the authors, by the different authors that we have deployed, and we have submitted them, as you, some of you may know, for peer review. They are available on our website uh, for peer review. And the uh, end of the peer review for the different studies uh, is that we have a different timeline for the closing of this peer review. The first one is, is, going, is, is about to close by the end of this month. Uh, but uh, other studies, uh, the peer review will be extended at least f 
for the first or the second week of, of, of next month. Uh, then uh, we will have an expert meeting that will be held in March uh, 2020 to consider the compilation and synthesis, and synthesis of views and information and the peer-reviewed studies. The expert group will also develop options for operational terms and their implications to provide conceptual clarity on the issues of digital sequence information on genetic resources and identify key areas for capacity building. The outcomes of the expert group, uh, by the way, in terms of these, uh, organizing the expert group, uh, we have already uh, finalized the composition of the group, we have identified the experts, and uh, we are now reaching out to the experts, probably we have uh, finished that, uh, inviting them uh, to, to this expert meeting and asking their confirmation. The outcomes of the expert group meeting will be considered by the working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework as per the request of COP14 in its decision 1420. The working group is expected to submit recommendations to the COP at its 15th meeting uh, on how to address digital sequence information on genetic resources in the context of the post-2020 biodiversity framework. There are also some developments um, which I think are worth reporting under other processes concerning digital sequence information. The governing body of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which held its eighth uh, mid session from 11 to 16 uh, of this month, requested in its resolution on cooperation with the CBD, uh, the Secretary of the Treaty to continue following processes within the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol concerning digital sequence information on genetic resources and providing information on relevant international treaty activities and collaborate and as appropriate coordinate with the Secretariat of the CBD on issues related to digital sequence information on genetic resources in order to promote coherence and mutual supportiveness between the Convention and the treaty and to report that uh, the outcome to the government to the governing body at its next session um, there's also there was also in this governing body meeting uh, there was one important resolution that failed to pass uh, the resolution uh, was in the context of enhancing the multilateral system under the international treaty there was a a pack, a pack, there were a package of issues uh, that includes uh, genetic resource information. Of course, that resolution didn't pass. And one of the reasons is the difference uh, among the governing body members on how to handle digital sequence information. Yeah, that's what I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And If you'd be kind enough to continue on with access and benefit sharing, please. Yes. Thank you, Chair. The conference of the parties serving at the meeting of the parties to the Nagoya Protocol adopted at its third meeting a decision on a preparation for the follow-up to the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020. The decision welcomed uh, another decision by the conference of the parties to the convention and it invited parties to the protocol to participate in the process for the for developing the post 2020 global biodiversity framework and encouraged parties to undertake measures to enhance implementation of the Nagoya protocol in the context of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework in response to this decision a global consultation on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in relation to access and benefit sharing in the Nagoya Protocol was held in Nairobi on the 25th of August 2019, just prior to the first meeting of the working group on post-2020 global biodiversity 
framework. The global consultation that was held in Nairobi was the first step that was taken in response to the decision of the parties to the Nagoya Protocol uh, and was financially supported by South Africa. The consultation was attended by a total of 92 participants, including representatives of the parties to the convention as well as the protocol, nine representatives of indigenous people and local communities, and about nine representatives of organizations in academia. The participants considered a background not prepared by the Secretariat to facilitate the consultation. The report of the consultation includes a summary of outcomes and a synthesis of views expressed, including some possible elements for goals and milestones that may, to just to start with, address uh, ABS issues and Nagoya Protocol. The report and associated documents are now made available at the website of the Secretariat. The Secretariat is exploring possibilities for further consideration on uh, of ABS and the Nagoya Protocol. And the Secretariat believes that further consultation focused on ABS and the Nagoya Protocol needs to be held, uh, possibly in conjunction with the third meeting of the Working Group on post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework in July next year. The timing will be appropriate uh, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is it allows for the Compliance Committee under the Nagoya Protocol a chance to make its share of contribution. The committee, the Compliance Committee, was requested in uh, one of the decisions of COPMOP of the Nagoya Protocol to consider how to support and promote compliance with the Nagoya Protocol within the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. The next meeting of this committee, uh, which allows it to respond to this request, will be held from 21 to 23 April 20, uh, next year. Furthermore, the meeting of the Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group meeting uh, group uh, on digital sequence information on genetic resources is scheduled to take place, as I said earlier, from 17 to 20 March next year. The outcomes of, of these two meetings are expected to feed into the next consultation on ABS and the Nagoya Protocol in the context of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And now I'll turn to uh, Jyoti for an update on sustainable use. Thank you, Chair. I hope Nadine and I can provide adequate gender balance at this point. Um, I don't have much to say about sustainable use. However, uh, we just wanted to inform you that we are uh, in the midst of preparing a scoping note, uh, which um, uh, should be available in December. Uh, we are also trying to make provisions for a consultation on sustainable use uh, and are in the process of, um, of um, um, developing a concept note for that too. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that complete the list of speakers. Uh, you will have noticed there is a couple uh, area that we have not ha have update for. It's because they're very much in development. So watch the uh, scoping document that will be posted on the web. That's where you'll see the, the other updates. So uh, this completes uh, this uh, agenda item. I will now turn to my co-chair for the next one. Thank you, co-chair. We shall now go to agenda item three. Uh, that is dealing with the preliminary overview of the zero draft. And um, at this point, again, my co-chair and I will go and make a presentation and then we come back. So as the uh, slides come on, again, I would like to recognize the presence of the former executive secretary, 
I don't know whether he recalls it or not, but um, in uh, Japan in 2010, I sat very close to him during the development of the current strategic plan. And we used to talk a lot about these targets, spending long hours. So thank you for coming, and uh, we hope you participate in this up to the very end. So um, let me now go to what you've been waiting for, and that is on the uh, uh, update on, on this zero draft, preliminary zero draft. Now, before even I say anything further, this framework, there's a lot of interest in it, a lot. Not only for your parties or for your parties to the CBD, but even outside. And therefore, we need to take that into account that we are developing a global framework, a framework that should really generate that global action on biodiversity. So you'll find it will take care of those various stakeholders we are listing there, civil society, IPLCs, business, NGOs, outside us, the usual, the parties. So it is, a, as I said again, it is a, a strategy for all. And let's bear that in mind so that when it is picked, anybody out there can be able to use it. And that is the good thing with the CBD that we always consider matters in a very broad way. So let's go to the next slide. Now, you've been hearing about um, the theory of change. I'll first talk about the elements here, and then try to talk a little bit more in the second slide. So when you look at this um, drawing, you'll see on, this, on the far side this way is the dreamland, the 2050. And then next to it, you have the goals, 2050 goals. Then you have the 2030 goals. You have that part which deals with action. And then you have the tools. There is meeting the needs of people. And then the way we intend to work or the way we work. I'll unpack all this in the second one. But broadly, and then up you have the means of implementation, uh, stroke and enabling conditions. And then you have got the transparency and accountability here. So that is first to tell you the elements that we are thinking. And yesterday there was a discussion here about transformative change. Now let's, let's go to the next slide. So when you look at 2050, where you're saying biodiversity is conserved, it is valued, it is restored, it is wisely used, you are looking at a place which is f much better than now. That is not easy. But we are saying that by that time, then the ecosystems are healthy, everything is fine, we are all happy, needs are being met. That is the dreamland. But you know that population of the world is increasing. We are now at about 7 point, is it 7.5? By 2050, we could be over, maybe over 10 billion. The space is going to remain the same. The dream is that one. So how do you get there? And therefore, we are saying that um, we shall need those long-term goals, the 2050 long-term goals. And this time around, we need to be taking into account the three objectives of the convention. We are talking about conservation, sustainable use, benefit sharing. That should happen. Now, when you come to the actions, the actions have been picked from the IIP based report. Those five, those are the direct drivers of biodiversity loss, as highlighted in there. So when you are going to be dealing with the threats, you are going to be dealing with the drivers of biodiversity loss, as outlined there, land use change, climate change, pollution, overexploitation, invasive species. But from yesterday's discussion, it came out also very strongly that if we are going to be transformative in approach, then as you tackle 
the um, direct drivers, there will be need to look at how you handle the indirect drivers. That is what we picked yesterday from those of you who are here yesterday. And so when you come down meeting the needs of people, like I told you, you're not going to stop any human being from being fed, from being having a good life or anything whatsoever. And the populations are increasing. So meeting the human needs will continuously be the case. And then you have got the tools for implementation, as you see it there. And you have got the things to do with the incentives and so forth. That is where perhaps we could bring in the aspect of dealing with the indirect drivers. And then responsibility and accountability. I heard parties saying, or some people saying, that if you cannot report on something like this framework, then why have it? So as we implement, we should be able to report. So this is broadly speaking about this framework. And you look at up there is the means of implementation, resource mobilization, capacity building, technology transfer. Of course, we have had issues where to put biosafety. But I think um, securing benefits, sorry, securing uh, use, the safe use, as you see it somewhere here. This is where perhaps biosafety could be in. But again, we have not forgotten biosafety. We've not. We've, we've just continued to discuss this subject. It is implied in there. OK? They go to the next. So this one, I think we are not changing it. And therefore, perhaps we should not debate a lot about it. So it remains as is. I will not read it now. We all, most of us know it. Go to the next. Now, when you are thinking about the goals, we are thinking at those levels, at the species, at ecosystems, and then for benefits, benefit sharing. So lots of discussions have happened. What do we want? What, what, what do we want to see 2050? Maybe preventing extinction. People have even said zero extinction. Increasing abundance of species. That is the other thing that has come out. Improving the status of threatened species. Are they going to be, by 2050, shall we be um, seeing these species which are threatened? Their status improved. You could have heard almost every day these days, internet has made life either very complicated or very frustrating or very, very, I don't know, I should term it. News come in every time, every time, every time. A few days ago, I, I saw on a platform that a certain species had also gone extinct again. So species are getting extinct in the Mideast. What does that mean to us anyway? Then genetic diversity, then also looking at the red list of the ICN ecosystems. Here, basically, it is looking at change in trends of ecosystems, degradation, fragmentation. What do we want to see? Maybe these are the things that should not be there in 2050. When you look at the benefits, this is one of the things that is even captured in the 2050 vision. If you could go back there a little bit. Back slide a bit, but the previous slide. You see, yeah, there. Delivering benefits essential for all people. So benefit sharing and others tend to be captured, if it is captured in the vision. Let's go ahead. We can go to seven now. So when you are thinking about going to 2050, you need to be thinking of what goals you need in 2030 to take you to 2050. So we are talking of you having or us having very, very good goals as a stepping stone to 2050 as we start the journey 30 years from now. But 30 years may appear a lot, but it is not, as we have seen with the 10 years, which is down with us now. Then there are three aspects, of course, that we shall be looking at, species and ecosystems. Uh, genetic diversity is embedded in there when you talk about species and ecosystem. We are not saying that the genetic diversity is not covered. Sustainable use, 
and then the benefit for people. The last one for me. That is it. My coach, I will explain to you the next slide. This is the vision, the mission of 20 what? 2020, 20, or the existing one. 2011, 2020 strategic plan. We cannot shy away from it, we were a part of it. So let's make it better this time around. Uh, coach here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Francis. So here is the statement of the vision as we have it. It is a very complete statement, cover very well everything. And if I flip to the slide, now the next slide. Now, can you quote me the mission? Probably not. It's 100 words. It's very long. It's hard to understand. So what we want in a, miss in a mission is it must be a stepping stone toward 2050. It, uh, it must be action-oriented, inspirational, and motivating. And uh, there was probably useful to capture in it the other milestone for 2040, for example. So if you move to the next slide, here's a few examples. The first one is under 30 word. Implement solution across society to address biodiversity loss and enhance benefits contributing to the global development agenda and by 2030 putting the world on a path to achieving the 2050 vision. That is a proposal. That's a proposal that has been uh, described in various paper. I, uh, I, I know there has been discussion among regional group and sub-regional groups and I'm looking forward to the, your output. What the message we want to leave with you is it is natural in assembly like ours here to want to add to a document. You want to add a few words because there is something you really care about. But be careful because it's easy to get back to the 100 words and to the mission that nobody would ever read. So I encourage you to look for short uh, mission, something that is under 30 words. There is two other suggestions below the first one. I don't need to go through those two, but that's the message we leave with you with this proposal for a 2030 mission. Next slide. Now, Francis and I thought it would be useful to drill down into that model and to focus on certain area. And the first area to focus on, now that we've talked about the goals, for 2050, the, the vision, and uh, the 2030 goals is to look at the action agenda, which is reducing threats and meeting people's needs. Next slide. So on the left here, you see exactly the same box that you saw on the uh, previous slide, the five drivers of uh, biodiversity loss, as uh, described in the best reports, and our understanding of the uh, use side. And you will see that in some cases we've been able to already develop pretty well a set of sub-targets. And for example, on land use, uh, there is, we see three aspects, the planning of your land, and that's going to be uh, uh, an important aspect of the workshop uh, in not next week, but the week after. Conserving and protecting and the restoration. So we basically see the land use aspect of our work articulating around those three as aspects. Climate change, no surprise, mitigation, adaptation. Invasive species, at this point, the line is empty. It does not mean that there is nothing that will go in there. It means that at this point in time, we're not secure enough to put item. Pollution, the idea here is to, uh, appro to take an approach that uh, beyond some generic statement, focus on priority substances. So we went to the best reports and uh, looked at uh, what was there and extracted plastics, pesticide or biocide, and then the nutrient questions. We heard that there was a lot of support for those three, and we expect that in draft zero there will be specifics around that. Overexploitation touched many, many sectors. 
But again, we looked at the uh, the IPES reports and, uh, and uh, determined that priorities should be put to certain sectors, not to say that others are excluded, but that's a starting point. And you may choose to change the list. You may be a four, four instead of three or two, but uh, we felt a way to get uh, concrete action was to be very specific and stay away from general statement. Moving to sustainable use, the first one, uh, we did some, um, some thinking around that, and then four uh, sub-targets emerge. Uh, providing material goods, this is about feeding people, providing shelter, uh, what nature provides us. The second one is regulating service, providing, protecting people from severe weather events, or filtering uh, drinking water, all those kind of regulating service. Um, the third one, intrinsic value of nature, is a bit of a different philosophical look at that, and it came out strongly in a number of thematic consultation, is for a large number of people, they, re they see nature uh, in terms of what it provides to them. How can it feed them? How can it provide them protection? But there is also an equally large number of people that look at nature as something they want to see, and they want to know is available to them. So that's a different way of looking at it. Uh, I know it is controversial, and then I've heard quite a bit of discussion, but we felt it was important to put it on the list. And then finally, the notion of the cultural, social, and ceremonial needs, very important. I don't need to explain that further to you. There was lots of discussion like we last week around that. The safe use was related to the uh, bio, uh, bio safety. Uh, we received some input from the bio safety people very recently. We were not able to uh, reflect that just yet, but we expect there would be further elaboration. And then finally, benefit sharing is an important part. Next one. Now, um, it seems funny to, uh, to switch so quickly from the action agenda to the means of implementation, et cetera, but I'm sure there will be discussion in the next hour. Means of implementation enabling condition, and I don't have a breakdown slide for this one. Um, for the, the means of Im implementation, we're talking about uh, these, those effective things that we control. Uh, capacity building, technology transfer, traditional knowledge, resource mobilization, and you heard about the process associated with that, and we hope to get some, some uh, good input from that. Enabling condition are those condition aspects that are outside of our control, political will, uh, other condition outside of our control, and then there is no box related to that at this point, and we're in your hands in terms of telling on, on seeing how we can in incorporate that. Responsibility and transparency, uh, very important, something that came out strongly from parties in our consultation. There is planning, reporting, and, and review, but you heard Nadine, uh, there is a quite elaborate process on that, so I'm looking forward to uh, the outcome of that. Next slide. Tools and solution. Um, in, uh, you see that mainly we've uh, identified three area, economics and incentive, and we can expect to have uh, some targets around the, the proper valuation and the economical aspect of what we do, <laughs> as well as how we look at incentive and change to the regime of incentive. This is a, a target that has existed in the past. How we treat in the future is going to be very important. It seems to be that a number of studies are showing uh, that the uh, kind of change we're contemplating to address the IBIS assessment is one that can be financed by uh, means that are already around. The challenge is how you move from the current state to the next state and how you finance the transition. So we're looking forward to your ideas on that. Laws and regulation and policies is something that is very important. It came in a number of subjects. In a couple slides, I'll show you some of the, some of the linkage, and you may want to have some targets around that. Behavior change is those other ways governments and organizations are trying to make people do different things by encouraging through education, et cetera, and we felt it was important. There could be a number of other blocks in there. We, we had at some points uh, men explicit mention of the production and consumption system, so we choose not to put it at this time, but uh, definitely I'm looking forward on comments on that. Next slide. Now, 
in conclusion, we wanted to illustrate to you how uh, all those condition tools and solutions are feeding into more than one action and how the various actions are leading, are leading to those results. And, and we're going to do that through a couple examples. Next slide. Here is choosing biosafety. Basically, if we, uh, if we look at biosafety and the input we receive from them, in order to make progress on biosafety, you need all of those means of implementation, capacity building, you need resource, you need technology. And then, in addition to that, you need uh, an appropriate regulatory regime in place. So you can see those two areas supporting uh, biosafety. And then, if you move to the next slide, you look at pollution. How do you address plastics, fertilizers, and, uh, and um, um, biocides? Well, again, uh, there is a lot about uh, uh, laws, regulation, and policy. But in addition, you need the right incentives and economics. Are we subsidizing fertilizer? Is that the right thing to do for, uh, for to reach uh, our goals on a biodiversity perspective? Question we're going to be asking ourselves. Is there the right uh, behaviors out there in terms of the uh, um, in terms of the behaviors of our agriculture sector? And 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 again, you need those capacity building, resource and mobilization. So this is just two slides to explain that various aspects are feeding into the action, and the action all together are relating to the goals for 2030 and 2050. I think that's my last slide, but let's see. Yes. So thank you very much. I think we're going to go back to our seats and move to the next. Uh. OK, thank you. Uh, with that, I will now hand over the microphone to my co-chair. Thank you. And uh, I've just been informed that uh, there is a, a, a problem with the, the technology. And uh, normally, I would get a list. When you press your button, I would get a list of, uh, of uh, the, 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 request from the request from the floor. Apparently, I am not gonna, we are not going to get that. So um, I think we're going to have to make use of the good old hand in the air. Uh, and um, uh, bear with us, Francis and I will work together to make that happen. Just a second. Okay, so let's now open the floor. Uh, we have a little bit less than an hour, so uh, we, we have quite a little bit of time. And as uh, mentioned earlier, there is people, there is about uh, 25, 26 people last time I checked on YouTube. So, and they are sending us comments uh, through a chatting service. So we'll try to, uh, to intercede them between you. But the, the floor is all open now to comments and questions. Please, and please identify your country first. Thank you. I am uh, from Mexico. Thank you very much for your great presentation. And I have uh, two questions. First, in um, the overarching framework, the theory, theory of change you showed us, um, we don't see mainstreaming there. I mean, I probably is there somewhere, but it's not explicit and for Mexico would be very, very important to have it explicitly. So I think we could manage to put it there. And the other thing is that in one of your presentations, you say, and also in, in the um, addendum four of, of the documents we are going to see tomorrow, you talk about 2050 goals, of like more general overarching goals towards the 2050 visions. And then here you also talk about a 2030 goals. But in the document, you talk about a 
2030 targets. So I, I think it's really important to maintain uh, n names of the hierarchical um, tree that we are building on. So I guess it would be 2050 goals and 2030 targets and just be consistent with, the, with those names because otherwise it gets very confusing. Thank you. Or I don't know if there are another goals for 2030, so if you could just could clarify. Thank you very much. So um, maybe first, uh, mainstreaming is on the, you know, if you go back to the first slide, you will see a box that's called the way we work. And I don't know if uh, I can ask uh, to get that slide out. And you will see in that box that mainstreaming is mentioned. Um, and then your second point about terminology, yes, that's why we want to have a glossary. You, here you go. You can see, I don't know, it's not there yet. But on, in terms of the, the, the terminology, um, 20, 30 goals are different from targets. They're the status of the ecosystem. Like, here we go, you can see that. And then, uh, yeah. Coach. Other points. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the co-chairs for uh, finally showing us uh, something. And uh, from the full house, you can see we've been anticipating uh, what you would show us. And I think we are, are very thankful that a lot of the ideas that we've been sharing with you are finding um, expression on, um, on this document. Um, my comment is a, a simple one. Um, I agree with Mexico. Uh, we see mainstreaming as quite important. And so um, it's not just about the way we work, but it needs to move into uh, the actual framing itself. And then um, uh, the top part around means of implementation and enabling conditions. We maintain those two are not the same and that they shouldn't be uh, phrased uh, necessarily together. And um, in, in the next slide, uh, you can see that your enabling conditions disappear and you're only left with means of implementation more than enabling conditions. So perhaps uh, the enabling conditions can move and uh, support responsibility and transparency and be part of um, that uh, element because an action agenda would require us to have specific targets on those means of implementation. And um, then it would make it much clearer uh, that these means of implementation relate to resource mobilization, access to uh, resources, uh, provision of resources, we can set targets for that, we can set targets for access to technology, <laughs> Uh, specific targets for capacity building, as well as uh, incorporation of traditional knowledge. But we are very excited, and we are going to have lots of fun uh, with <laughs> this. Thank you, South Africa. We'll take uh, two or three comments, and, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll respond. I think Finland in the back, followed by Costa Rica. Yes, hello, uh, Maria Rohanen Lehto from Finland. I have a very simple question for you. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the work program that, or the work plan that we, uh, we discussed in Nairobi, it looks like it, this relates to biosafety. Um, uh, in the work program that we discussed in Nairobi in August, um, the, the, our table says that the liaison group is preparing, or this is this is what we know, of course, from our decisions, that the liaison group on uh, on the Cartagena protocol is preparing the biosafety component, and they have indeed done so in in October, as we heard, and in in in, in Nairobi we were of the. Uh, 
understanding that, that this biosafety component is presented already in working group uh, two in, in February. And now when I s looked at your slides, your arrow seemed to fly over working group two and, and biosafety uh, seemed to be moved to, to uh, working group uh, three meeting. Have I misunderstood something? Can you please provide some clarification? Thank you. Thank you. Kostarika? Thank you, Chair. Just, um, yes, I need a, a clarification in order to understand uh, better this uh, framework that you have proposed. I mean, under the sub-target, what are we expecting under the sub-targets? And if we talk, um, for instance, about protected areas, protected areas will be included into the sub-target planning in the target land use change, for instance, that is something that I want to, to know. Thank you. Thank you. We got, uh, we got three, three, uh, three sets of comments, so maybe we'll, we'll, um, we'll address some of them. Some I, I will note and we'll carry further. Um, the, uh, I note the comment from uh, South Africa on enabling condition and, and how we, we could position that, so I don't think there is a need to say more there. On, uh, on the, the, the process for biosafety, point raised by Finland, um, we, will, we, will, uh, we will, yes, biosafety will be considered that open ended regime group two, that's an oversight. On the points about uh, targets and sub-targets, um, I don't think that we necessarily need to have sub-targets in every place, but that's my, my personal view. I've not discussed that with Francis. Um, but we, we certainly recognize that there is places where it's useful. In, in particular, should there be a target around percentage of protected area, I would imagine this would find its place under the conservation part uh, sub-targets. So under, under land use change, there was three sub-targets, one on planning, which kind of relates to, I don't know, if you wish to have a, a, a targets around the land use planning and then planning of networks, all those concepts around re red line uh, process, etc. So that's about planning how, what you do across your landscape. The second one on conservation is actually how do you implement some of that planning. And then should there be a target, a 17% or whatever it will be, that would be where it would find its place. Thank you. Okay, I think, um, thank you, Co-Chair. There was uh, also uh, some comments on uh, 2030 goals, 2030 targets, 2050 goals. I think we will make it clear if it is not clear now, but um, you realize that we are talking of mission 2030. So that mission is going to have goals, just like currently you have five goals for this current strategic plan, which, which it takes you for 10 years. So even that one, much as you have the long-term goals to 2050, but you will need one first, okay, for 2030. And those are the ones that will have targets and so forth. So, th so those three will be there in the framework. Okay, I see you nodding. I think that is clear now. Okay, going back to the question, I've noted Belgium as a question. Others ends up, it's good for me to have a bit of a list. Okay, I got the EU and at the back. So Belgium, Ines, you, you're the, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. And also our thanks to, uh, to the co-chairs for presenting this. It really helps us to start thinking in a more concrete way on the ways ahead. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of opportunity to come back to all the different elements that you mentioned. I just would like to come back to one of the things that was mentioned in the beginning. It's about the 2050 goals. And you have a slide there which also shows that um, gives already some kind of idea of where we want to be in 2050 and then that we should think back from there and develop a 2030. Um, I may have misunderstood it because, of course, I mean, you bring in a lot of information in a very short time. but. From what we've, saw, we've seen, that ambition is not where we would like to see it in 2050. We are talking about the need for a transformational change, 
everybody's telling us the house is on fire, so we shouldn't start thinking about the paint. We should actually start thinking about getting everything out and, and, and save what's there. That is not reflected in that slide from what I saw. So it'd be very useful to see what you think, because we need to have that kind of transformational change as an objective in order to be able to plan for 2030. It'd be very good to have your idea on that. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've saw Anteo at the back. European Union, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Also from my side, first of all, a uh, big thank you for this presentation and all the work done. Uh, thank you also for bringing uh, together in this slide so many elements, and I think uh, so many elements that are important for so many of us, uh, which actually is also one of the, uh, well, my, my the questions at least I ask myself, uh, isn't this too much? It's really a lot, uh, it, and it looks a bit complex, so that's, I think, what something we want to think about. At the same time, we also from the EU and member states' perspective, we always asked for an encompassing framework, so uh, probably we are ourselves to blame as well. Uh, my question is, uh, first of all, I would like to echo the, the remark from Mexico that mainstreaming uh, is it's not clear for us where it is, and it is extremely important. Uh, secondly, uh, the 2050 goals, uh, I think when it's about the outcomes, we would uh, wonder, I, we think we also need 2030 milestones for those outcomes so that we don't postpone actions and, and, and uh, get the feeling, the wrong feeling that we would have time uh, for getting there. We need to to have also really focus on the threats if oceans are adequately reflected in this slide. I mean, I can see potential options for putting that in, in terms of over-exploitation, pollution, and invasive species, but maybe it deserves uh, further explicit attention here. Um, also a question uh, on another slide you had with regard to some of the targets. It reflected agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. And I wonder also in the context of mainstreaming, which um, also is a, an extremely important part of the post-2020 framework, uh, what, what and how will the other sectors, if at all, be reflected in this context? Um, and then maybe a potential uh, response to one of the questions on your earlier slide and the comment from South Africa on the issue of means of implementation versus enabling conditions. Um, the means of implementation could be viewed as a subset or as part of an um, integral part of tools and solutions. Um, so that might help to simplify um, if enabling conditions are those four particular elements that you've highlighted in the previous slide. Means of implementations are also tools, so the economic incentives, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And um, let's, uh, let's take a minute to, to comment on those uh, three, three points. Um, I think I'll take together a little bit of the comments from uh, from Anteo and from Ines, um, and I'll start by by uh, by doing the more mechanistic or architecture comments from Anteo and and, and move to the uh, more content or ambition one. What what we meant in in creating that uh, architecture is to have um, some goals for 2030 and 2030 that are about status of ecosystem or result of what we're trying to achieve. So what's the world we want to see in 2050? What are the characteristics we want to achieve? And then how does that step down to 2030? And really what we felt is that in the middle on the action, it's more, it's more about uh, the mechanism and the action we will take. And in that sense, Protecting uh, area is is part of a, it's a tool. So when you designate a, a an open, you designate some area and you limit some level of activity, be it a full park or some kind of other activity with sustainable, that's the way to an end. So that's the difference to illustrate the difference. Now. Uh, Ines is asking some really important question about about how do we set the goals and what should be in those goals? 
And I think that's a very important question for this assembly here. We will put some ideas on the table, but yet it's up to you to tell us if those ideas are ambitious enough. If you feel that those ideas are not going to get us to uh, where you want us to be in 2050, tell us. Uh, Francis and I will not be offended. We've been repeating ourselves since, the, since uh, we came back from Nairobi that whatever we, we write, you will change, and that's okay. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what it is about. That's a party-driven process. It's a party where you are telling us. So, of course, we're going to give it our best shot at providing you the text. But what we're trying to do is to write a text that enable you to have those discussions, not necessarily the end uh, language. Uh, in terms of uh, the comments about the, the ocean from uh, Daniela at the back there, Daniela, you must have been in the ocean work. Oh, no, it's not Daniela. Ah, oh, I, I, I could I do that. Uh, the, the, uh, the, you must have been in the, the ocean workshop uh, last week. That's a, that is very much a, a, a point that was made, that we should watch our language. We seem to have a kind of a land-centric language that uh, is not very ocean, coastal, and marine friendly, and we need to correct that. Nevertheless, when it comes to the uh, IPES uh, assessment and uh, the, the, the ecosystem change, if I want to use neutral language, um, the, the response seems to be quite different. On, a, on, a land, slide, on the land uh, side of things, uh, the action is related to protecting and drawing lines on land. When you get to the marine side, we're talking more about how you manage activities taking place on the ocean and how those activities... The ones you've talked about, um, the, 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 the water per se, you also should tack in, uh, tackle the aspect of freshwater ecosystem. So all these are good ideas that we shall take on board. Thank you. I now have Ezekiel, and I see Canada, and then I see Brazil. Ezekiel. Thank you very much, good chairs. Four comments. One again on mainstream, it may be if we move from the way we work and send it to means, can be more explicit. We have very concrete actions. We should remind, for example, the adoption by FAO, the strategy to mainstream biodiversity into sectors which has specific actions, maybe can give more visibility there. And also to know about the how the feedback from the informal advisory group on mainstreaming can also provide elements. Second, on the invasive species slide, um, it was like empty, but then we should also bear in mind these actions on identification, control, eradications to fill. Third one on pollution, it's nice to see um, some elements like plastic and so on, but uh, what about air, soil? inland waters and marine, maybe also to consider that dimension to make it more explicit. I think all the contents are there. And lastly, on this difference and how uh, do you advise us to work on having two sets of goals, one on 2030 that looks like more immediate now to, to keep working, and this is in relation to what you are asking us um, to work uh, next week and to have another set for 2050 goals. Um, if we need to prioritize or how you help us to avoid confusion on the two sets. Thank you. Thank you, Canada, followed by Brazil. Thank you very much. Um, we, I mean, there's certainly, I think, a lot of specific ideas in the room, and, and, and people are looking for their pet topics, and, and, and there's lots of specific suggestions or questions that we could have. I think with our two comments, we'll take a higher level approach to it. Um, we'll all have a good chance, I think, in, in OED, OEWG2 to go into the specific details of each of the proposed targets in the zero draft. Um, so one general um, comment to make, I think building on the comment that was made by Anateo in the EU, um, and probably our own fault, but we've talked about needing something this time around that's simpler. And certainly what you've come up with here is something 
that is very comprehensive and that is trying to gather everyone's views together, uh, I just wonder how we're going to find that balance between something that's, that we want, that's simpler, that's easier to communicate, that engages more people, while at the same time addressing the need to touch on all the various aspects of this very, very broad convention. So something that maybe collectively as a group we need to think about going forward. Um, secondly, uh, a comment just on, on process, um, and this is a good slide actually to use. We see that we, yesterday we were here talking the whole day uh, about the scientific evidence base, and a main piece of that is IPBES and the, the direct drivers of biodiversity loss. You have the five of them listed up here. Um, and we note that we have uh, either thematic consultations or processes in place to address two of them, but not all five of them. And we're not suggesting that there should be more thematic consultations, because I think there is probably, we're probably running out of time, but we need to have a think about how we're going to develop clear ways forward post-2020 on pollution, on invasive uh, species, and on climate change. Um, something that we'll really be pushing next week at Substa as well, perhaps to try to help you guys find uh, a way or an approach where we can address those. Thank you. Thank you. Basil. Thank you so much, Francis and Basil, for all the work that have, you have been doing in, in promoting this agenda and in coming up with a very nice graph, which I can see some elements of our original triangle of developing countries. <laughs> and I thank you so much for that, for taking our original proposal into consideration. Um, I believe that what most of developing countries have been discussing is that the importance of the theory of change of, or of transformative change is in the way that we achieve a full and effective implementation of the convention and that means the full and effective implementation, implementation of the three objectives of the convention. And in this sense, um, I would be very grateful if you could explain um, what is the difference between benefits shared and benefit sharing in the 2030 goals? And we would prefer to retain the original language, sustainable use, which is um, the second objective of the convention, and benefits sharing, which is the third objective of the convention, so that we are more clear of what we are talking about and we also are more um, legitimate with the Article 1 of the Convention, which is the spirit of this uh, Convention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, lots of comments and, and I particularly welcome uh, comments related to, uh, you know, directed to the group is how do we keep something simple and how do we uh, are comprehensive and that has been a challenge for us um, and taking also responding partly to, uh, to Luciana. When we started the design, we took all of your submission and we were uh, projecting them on a wall while we were doing the drafting and we tried to come up with a model that took the best of each. And, and, and kind of try to be simpler. We're in your hand in terms of hiding uh, stuff in, being more explicit, trying to find maybe the, the way is, is, is there may be several graphs. There, is, there may be one very simple, and that's why we choose to project those into three level. If you flip back to the previous slide, that was our try to have a simple uh, description. This is what we're trying to do, the simple. And then, and then, and then maybe we wanna we wanna keep that level very simple, and and then uh, have something more complex for the future. But we're in your end for that. In terms of uh, the the way, uh, there was a couple of questions related to uh, pollution, climate change, and, and invasive species. Obviously, for for pollution and climate change, we we're looking heavily to uh, substance input, and that's clear that for uh, invasive, there is a process with an attack that I think is meeting very soon, next week. So we're looking forward to that. Um, in terms of the, the wording, uh, you know, benefit share, the benefit sharing, sustainable use, etc., we were trying to keep a status 
wording into the goals column and action wording into the action column. And that's why uh, we, we make a distinction. But if, if the will of the party is to keep it simple, maybe we don't need to be so uh, Cartesian about this. Francis. Yes, um, I think there was a discussion about benefit sharing and benefit shared, <laughs> if, if, if I thought there are differences. We will try to harmonize those, but when you look at one, one looks to be more like an outcome kind of stuff. If you're doing, if you, if you cut out benefit sharing arrangements or whatever, then by 2030, we, I think our dream is to see that, you know, benefits are shared. So one is more of like outcome, but one is more an action best one, but we can look at that. And um, the other one was on uh, invasive species and uh, looking at identification, eradication, control. I think those are good um, viewpoints and then looking at means, uh, mainstreaming to take it to means of implementation. I think uh, we've taken note of that. Uh, if it is going to be more clearer there, no problem at all. So let's go back to the next round of comments. I see, sorry, I see Germany there, followed by Switzerland, followed at the back there by CMS. So Germany, please. Thank you to the co-chairs and all the other presenters. I think this is a very good input for our thinking and our discussions and the state of play, so thanks a lot. I have the question about how the two presentations about the zero draft, which had the slide on arranging documents, and the theory of change slides in the second presentation really fit together. Because if I look at, at this draft zero, this is only, so do I get it right that this is only part of what you present here, what the overall framework will be? Because in the, in the draft zero, it's about the vision, goals, mission, goals, and targets, and an annex. But I, if I look here now on the zero of change, this picture is much broader, like the responsibility and transparency, which I would conclude that the aspect of planning also includes like the MP subs and instruments, what we discussed, I, what we heard, I think, quite often in Nairobi. So this is how I would take it, so maybe you could explain a bit more how these fit together. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Switzerland. Thank you, co-chairs. Two points I would like to, to raise. One, I want to echo those who said that the structure is not yet very, very clear. And I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, it's not only the mission statement or impact goal should be very simple, but also the structure of the targets and goals. And here I really would recommend that uh, we would have a, a very simple a simple structure. You have sub-targets, targets, objective 2030 and objective 2050. So that makes it already very complex, I think, to, to communicate. And the second point is that um, Francis was mentioning at the beginning of his presentation that it is a, a, a global framework, so um, should be the framework not only of CBD but also of the other um, conventions that um, are dealing with biodiversity. Um, how do you integrate the, the other conventions so that we can be sure that they will adopt this global framework? Um, what is the process to also invite them to come up with their own ideas on targets? Uh, I see a very important line, planning, reporting and reviewing. This is also, I think, an important element for the other conventions to structure this very well so that we don't have a duplication of reporting and, and uh, reviewing. So there is a lot of uh, still uh, to, to think of. So how do you proceed to have a clear idea on that? Thank you, Coach <laughs> Thank you. Amy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the co-chairs and the secretariat uh, for all the hard work. Uh, one overarching comment I'll bring now is I was expecting to see something about the uh, IPBES indirect drivers and a little surprised not to see it uh, because in my view, 
mean, that is what actually needs to be addressed to achieve transformational change. And really, if we don't address those indirect drivers, you know, however we design sort of the new boxes and, and these categories uh, might not advance us further than the current strategic plan. Um, I was thinking that mainstreaming, in a way, I mean, that's at the heart of it. I mean, mainstreaming is not a, a footnote. It's really about what do we do to address those indirect drivers, uh, our economic development, our population growth, et cetera. Um, looking at the indirect drivers also might unify the many different specific issues that different uh, of these boxes brings uh, and might be a way to get simpler about this because it gets at the root causes. And finally, uh, looking at the indirect drivers would also bring the strategic framework closer to the SDGs because that's where uh, you know these issues of balancing economic, social, and environmental goals, of course, exist. So, just a few observations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's it's good to see the the comments bringing the discussion in in a in a in a different area. On the, the first points about how you translate that model into uh, a document for, for draft zero, um, two, two elements of response. First, draft zero would include uh, the box on responsibility, transparency, and means of implementation enabling condition. Um, second, you have to remember that the framework is only one portion of the package going to COP15, there would be a number of elements that would be part of other decision. Or So what we see is probably a much more elaborated package uh, going to COP15 with, of course, the framework being at the center, but a number of other elements. And that uh, gets us to uh, the, the second point uh, from uh, uh, Switzerland about the integration of uh, other instruments. There is no doubt that if we want to reach our objective, uh, there is a, a there is a need to uh, uh, to uh, to engage the others, and 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 we got to be careful in the in the formulation and the, the procedures to do that. We cannot impose uh, any obligation on the other uh, convention. Uh, we can we can urge, we can recommend, we can encourage. And, and part of the package to COP15 will have all those elements. Now, how we, we do that, first, an example is the fact that uh, the CMS is here and they are part of the dialogue and they provide directly input into our, our process. And then a number of the organizations are here, the World Bank, we've been working very closely with, the OECD, as you saw earlier. So I think there is several levels. There is kind of the direct presence and I think we all value the input we're getting from them. Second, in terms of more formally doing that, there was the ban one, and very happy that there will be a second ban where we can get into the next level of detail, and those will be f feeding into our process. So I, I think we definitively uh, welcome that. Now, coming to the third point about uh, the uh, differentiation of direct and indirect drivers, as we all know, this was the subject of quite a bit of discussion at Open-Ended Working Group 1, and I don't think there was a consensus on, uh, on uh, the way we would be treating that in the future. As such, our choice as a co-chair has been not to use the terminology of direct or indirect drivers, and, and to uh, be specific where we knew that there was consensus and uh, leave room for uh, uh, discussion and further drafting where we felt there was not uh, consensus. Francis. Yes, um, thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, I think I'll still also echo in the aspect of uh, the indirect drivers. It came out yesterday we had uh, a workshop here looking at the knowledge-based, you know, support to the process and um, this issue of uh, Indirect, indirect drivers came up to build a layer on the direct drivers. And as the co-chair <laughs> said, I think we had different views um, in Nairobi in August. So if your guidance and direction now is that these need to be treated, the two, 
We are happy to do that, but we only appeal that you, the, the, the stakeholders, have to have a very common understanding so that um, we don't, again, um, find ourselves in a position where we get difficulties on them. But as I pointed out earlier, I think even when you're addressing some of these drivers of biodiversity loss, the intervention might indirectly or directly touch on indirect drivers because you're talking of land use change and then you look for you look at what is causing the land use change. What are your interventions? So you find somewhere you, you you're talking of direct drivers, but your intervention could go to the indirect drivers. But we were conscious as the chair said not to be so explicit at this point, just to call them drivers. Um, we also have had submission from other conventions into this process. That is the other way in which we are engaging these other biodiversity related uh, conventions. And um, we also have webinar on, uh, for these other processes for, for them to participate. So there are, there are a number of windows that uh, we shall bring the other convention on board. I think, as the co-chair said, is how effective we shall play the diplomatic language, not to appear like placing it uh, directly for them to do it, but making sure they have owned up to what is, has come up. Thank you. Hands up. I'm, I'm trying to recognize parties first. I see Austria, and uh, is that the UK at the back? And... Uh, Hmm? UNU at the back? Okay. So Austria, UK, and UNU for this round. Thank you very much, uh, Basil. Uh, and many thanks uh, to the co-chairs and to the colleagues from the Secretariat for the excellent presentations um, and all for your all hard work that went into this presentation and the process for developing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. There are actually three points I have noted during your presentations. Two of them have already been mentioned. The first is on mainstreaming. Uh, clearly, this needs to be much more strengthened uh, in this framework, and this is also related to the involvement of other MEAs in the development of the process. I think without their, their active engagement and involvement, we will not achieve our, our goals and, and targets. And this is, I think, uh, requires more work than just inviting them to, to workshops. It's, it requires an active engagement of these MEAs, definitely. My second point is also on the simplicity of the framework. Um, this. Uh, we really would prefer a KISS framework and not the KILL framework, so keep it simple and, and, and short and not a long and, and long-winded uh, framework. This is also related to communication, and this is actually my third point. In the COP14 uh, decision, we stress the importance of communication uh, throughout the process for developing uh, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, I was missing actually a presentation on the work on communication that is also uh, carried out by the Secretariat and we have heard that there has been an expert uh, meeting. I think the, the communication work is also very crucial in the development of the process. So um, we would uh, be very interested in hearing a little bit more on, on the communication aspect and on the implementation of the respective COP um, uh, request. Thank you. Thank you, UK. Uh, thank you, uh, co-chairs. Uh, thank you, uh, Basil and Francis. And I'd just like to add my uh, voice to the support that you've heard for, the, for this uh, framework and, and actually to congratulate you on bringing this together from the very varied discussions that we've had so, so far. And I think this does um, offer us a, a good way forward. Um, and the main elements of this, I think, uh, I think we can can support. Um, and whilst there is a bit of complexity in there, um, I think there are ways of presenting things which could could make it simpler. Um, and things like mainstreaming, I would say, are uh, you know very important. But it's more about the way we approach the issues, uh, uh, which would 
come out through all, all, all those different elements rather than necessarily be putting in a box on its own. It's, it's more about a, 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 an, approach, an overall approach. I just, the one area that has been, has been discussed here and I've got some, um, I'd like to you know, explore further is this relationship between the 2030 goals and the 2050 goals because that does seem to me to add another sort of layer of complexity which might not be necessary. I mean, if we have a, a 2030 mission, then uh, we could have within that 2030 mission um, sort of milestones or stepping stones towards the 2050 goals and, and therefore you don't need a separate set of goals perhaps for 2030 but rather a mission which includes a sort of progress check towards the 2050, 2050 goals and that might just simplify it, simplify it a little. Um, but uh, just, to, just to reiterate, I think this is uh, a good basis uh, and I think you've heard from many people here in responding that it does have a lot of support, so thank you very much. You, you and you. Yes, thank you, co-chairs. Uh, William Dunbar from United Nations University, and congratulations also uh, on all the progress on this very difficult uh, process. Um, thanks to all the speakers who provided uh, reports from the various workshops and consultations. I just uh, like to quickly mention uh, the uh, workshop that we held that was mentioned in your earlier slide. Uh, the expert thematic workshop on landscape approaches for the uh, for the pro for the framework. Uh, we had a very successful uh, meeting in September, uh, around 20 parties and around 150 uh, people there. Um, and just to uh, very quickly report on uh, outcomes as they were, were, are relevant to this, uh, to what we've been talking about today, um, participants uh, were fairly united in the idea that uh, landscape approaches are a good, uh, good way to integrate uh, the various uh, elements and, and stakeholders and, and all resources and everything uh, at the landscape level. Um, and in terms of this kind of policy making, that, uh, that if you uh, take that approach at the landscape level, on the ground, uh, that that naturally leads to a kind of uh, integrated uh, policy uh, at the higher levels um, also, um, which uh, leads to uh, can in influence uh, this kind of uh, the framework that we're talking about. Um, and uh, because of this, this integration, uh, that's sort of a horizontal and a vertical uh, integration, um, that that uh, can help to uh, bring together the biodiversity-related uh, conventions. Um, it could help to address indirect drivers as well as direct drivers in ways that uh, sort of sectoral and other kinds of uh, pro um, approaches uh, can't do as effectively. Um, and I think this is uh, exactly what we're talking about when we talk about the idea of transformative change. Uh, so sort of a shift to an integrated pol uh, process, integrated approach, is a shift to transformative change. Um, that's reflecting, I believe, what the outcomes of the workshop are. Um, we're just in the final stages of finalizing the report, which will be submitted to, uh, to the co-chairs. Um, and we hope that uh, the parties and other stakeholders will uh, will take uh, seriously. It contains a huge amount of uh, of concrete recommendations for the framework uh, that I don't have time to get into uh, right now. Um, and uh, we're having a side event to report in more detail on the outcomes during Substa. Um, and we look forward to continuing to to work with all of you um, in the future. We're open for discussions at any time. Uh, thank you, co-chairs. Thank you. Uh, first, as it relates to the, the request for a brief on, on communication, we're arranging for having the lead for communication uh, come over here and, uh, and uh, provide a brief at the end of uh, the, this session. So, uh, in terms of the, the, the various comments on, on the simplicity and, and how we communicate the framework, I think we, we welcome the suggestion and, and I think if there is a desire, and there seems to be a desire to, to simplify, uh, then, then we're looking forward to do that. And remember, this is an interim briefing, not a formal negotiation, so uh, you know, that's maybe something that is taken on as part of the open-ended working group, like we, we need to discuss that. Nevertheless, I think those, those comments are, are quite useful. Um, the, 
the uh, there were some comments around the uh, how we mainstream and and how we we characterize as transformative change. We've been struggling with the what is a transformative change. There is a definition in the best report, and that's that's very useful. But when you apply that in the CBD context, I, I think it's it it become relatively complex. So. Um, some of us were more comfortable talking about the change that is needed to reach the result we want. And, and yes, if in 2050 somebody look back and, and say uh, this will be transformative change, um, then, uh, then yes, be it. So I leave that reflection with you, but I, I'll turn to my co-chair who had time to reflect. Thank you, Coach. I think um, most of this, uh, at this round, there were just some very good um, comments that we need to, again, take into account. Uh, I, we take note of the issue of milestones as they're coming up. Um, so we shall look at this, but I think most of these were more of uh, what we need to be looking at. Thank you. So I saw two hands over there. There is no way. I think it's uh, Argentina, and another gentleman here with a beer. So, no way, please. Thank you, Chair. I just borrow a microphone here. So I hope the owner doesn't come back in time. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to to elaborate a bit on on indirect and direct drivers because it's a really important issue uh, in the new framework and we already have an RG target, target number four. Uh, it doesn't use the words indirect and direct drivers, but it uses uh, pro the, the words production and consumption. Uh, but but uh, uh, indirect drivers are also uh, used in other parts of, of the existing framework. So I think in order to, to deal with transformative change, I think uh, indirect and direct drivers are really important to address. Um, so, and from your comments, uh, I, I got that you didn't want to include it because there's no consensus on the issue. But then my response will be that there all is already consensus on IG Target 4. Uh, and this is also related to uh, new glossary reviews, which uh, an example is uh, susta sustainable supply chains and deforestation free supply chains, right? Which is, which is also, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily have to use those words in the new frameworks, but the, the questions need to be addressed. And it was said before that this is not only a framework for states, right? It's, a, it's a also a framework for business and other stakeholders. And if we don't address the production and consumption side properly enough in the new framework, I don't think, for instance, business will have much use of the new framework. So we, have, we careful, carefully have to consider on how we actually deal with produc production and consumption in the new framework. Thank you. Thank you, Norway, Argentina. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for the presentation that you have provided us. I think it, it really takes a lot of the considerations of all the parties, and we have a lot of work to, to, to do on it. So I wanted to, to comment on two things. One is um, that we, we really think that we're looking forward for an international framework of cooperation here to achieve the three objectives of the convention. So we really echo the comment by Brazil about having very clear sustainable use as a 2030 goal and very clear the share of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources as a 2030 goal. And uh, in general, um, I think that um, it, has, it has to be very important to reflect more on what can we actually achieve within CBD? Something about this was brought up in the discussions yesterday when we were addressing the issue of transformative change. 
and I would like to ask you, how do you think, how do you, what, what are your ref reflections regarding this framework that certainly includes elements that go far beyond the scope of what CBD does? A question, I mean, you're talking about a framework for all, and I wonder how will it be implemented when it's parties that actually implement CBD and the framework that CBD is going to adopt uh, at the national level. And also, when we're talking about things that go far beyond the, frame, the CBD scope, um, I wonder if, if we will have means to implement those uh, recommendations, goals that the framework is going to have. I see that the means of implementation and enabling condition, it's like above the framework. I don't really understand. Maybe it should be a column. And I also wonder how this framework that speaks to this, this, uh, this proposal that speaks to a lot of other uh, processes, how will it actually interact with uh, things that are actually taken care of uh, outside CBD? Thank you. Thank you. Please, please identify yourself. Thank, thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, my name is Pedro Plessy. I'm a technical advisor to the African Union Commission. <clears throat> I'm, I'm very glad it's not a negotiation because I wouldn't have had a voice if it is a negotiation. I'm also very sorry to tell you that, in, in my opinion, you really have to go back to the square one and start all over again. Because what you've presented here is going to result in a long shopping list of perceived insults to biodiversity and, and will inevitably result in a list of proposed solutions to those insults, which will then compete with a dwindling pool of scarce resources and will result in 10 years from us now doing what we're going to be, what we are doing now, which is acknowledging that we haven't been able to hit these targets. And that's because there isn't an, a transformative theory of change contained in this scheme. Um, I really would like to repeat something that I've said quite a few times before, but I think a lot of people probably haven't heard it. You have to have a driver of biodiversity um, increase you can't just go after trying to slow down the rate of biodiversity loss. Biodiversity is unique in its ability to increase. Its origin is the diversity of genetic resources, expressed as species, collected into ecosystems. Right? So if you focus on that understanding that all biodiversity is, is genetic resources and their utilization, and you put the fair and equitable sharing of the utilization of genetic resources at the top of your implementa implementation logic, you would honor the fact that that is how nature works. You would honor the fact that indigenous people and local communities have modified biology into biodiversity through their traditional practices. And you would provide an economic driver that would expand the benefits that are available from biodiversity and share them with all people and that would serve as an incentive for sustainable use. And you will get conservation and ecosystem restoration as a paid for, motivated, gladly delivered benefit as a result of that logic. Thank you, Chen. Thank you. Again, uh, a lot of useful comments and um, I think I will, uh, there was a couple question from Argentina that probably uh, merit a bit of a discussion in terms of how we approach it from the co-chair uh, side. Um, you're right, the, the implementation of uh, the targets is mainly within the, the reach of parties. Uh, when uh, in uh, 2010 you agreed to 17%, then the work on implementing them has been done by parties. And I expect that in the future that's going to continue to be the case. Uh, similarly, uh, you asked a question about uh, how this convention interacts with others, and there was a question uh, coming from uh, many sides on that. 
the the way uh, this convention is seen is a framework convention that set uh, targets and goals. It is not one that gets into the implementation of those goals. We rely on CMS, on Ramsar, on others, some being currently negotiated, others that will be negotiated in the future. And I think the, the challenge for us is to set those broad targets that drive to the, to the change we want. And when there are institutions that are directly related to those targets, for example, when we deal with pollution and there is an issue with uh, chemical components, we have chemical convention and they're looking forward to working with us. So perhaps the way to do that is to set some targets, then, then as part of the package you may have a, a decision that uh, encourage or urge, I don't know exactly what the right, right language, to include biodiversity in their process. And I'm pretty confident those are statements that they will welcome. Um, in, in, and that's, 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 it. that's the, the way we've been approaching it and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to see you. So Francis, anything to add? Yes, just briefly, um, on the, uh, I think still from Argentina was how will this also be implemented? Is it at the national level, if I got the comments right? But I think um, also the best way to handle some of this is as this process is happening at the global level, I think also at the national level when you are doing consultation on the process, you need to see how to bring these other focal points uh, into the process so that when this framework is adopted, it is easier for you to, to bring the other colleagues at the national level to help you out in some other areas that goes beyond the CBD. Because if you bring it at the end of it when it is adopted and they have not participated somewhere during the process itself, then it becomes a little bit difficult for them at that point. Um, and then I think there was a comment of how we are also trying to handle other processes outside the CBD. We have continuously uh, taken this on board. We plan to engage in some of those processes, and I think we are doing a plan on that. Um, we also have planned to attend some other region meet, regional meetings, if at all they are taking place, and we need to be there. Just to say that recently we participated in the AMSEN meeting, and if there are any other, AMSEN is the African Ministerial Conference on Environment, so if there are any other of these, we can still see how to fit within that. So we, we are having that contingency plan to see how we fit in with other processes. Thank you. Now uh, I have uh, one uh, statement to make and one uh, question to ask you. Uh, the, the first statement is to thank the interpreters for the excellent work. They will be uh, finishing their work in three minutes. And then the question I'm asking you is, do you want to continue this session without interpretation or do you want to finish now? So I heard finish now. <laughs> but I think there is kind of a proximity uh, privilege here. All right, so I see various views, and uh, I think uh, it would be, uh, let's, uh, let's first get the briefing on communication for a few minutes, and then we can see if we want to continue for a few minutes. Thank you. So David, uh, the question was, how do we address the part of the decision in 1434 directed to the Secretariat as it relates to communication? Great, thank you very much, Chair. I've been informed I have three minutes to do this, so uh, we'll see if we can be effective in communication. Uh, th the way to address that is let me give you a sense of the work that we have done over the last two days, uh, Thursday and Friday, at an expert communications workshop that uh, captures some of this matter. Uh, on Thursday and Friday of last week, we had uh, an informal, uh, open-ended uh, workshop uh, on communication in support of the negotiations for the post-2020 process, but including a discussion of how we will be moving forward and some of the principles behind communication and how it supports uh, everything that we do. Uh, as we've heard from uh, our discussion with IPBES uh, over the last few, few days, a little while, there is an increased awareness uh, of biodiversity. Uh, and so this increased awareness is an opportunity that we have before us. Communication is one element of influencing behavior change. 
It's not the only one, but it is an important first step. And so all of the discussions that we've had over the last little while have indicated that a stronger communications framework would indeed assist that process for behavior change. The meeting that was held on the Thursday, Friday uh, looked at First of all, very tactically, the question of how we're going to communicate over this next year to support this negotiation process. And in doing so, it began to open the dimensions for communication uh, plans and strategies that would accompany any eventual framework uh, that is negotiated. Uh, just in terms of report, this meeting brought together some 30 representatives, uh, including representatives of the presidencies of Mexico, Egypt, and China, representatives of the United Nations system, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, including a lot of the biodiversity ones, IPLCs, uh, youth, and a variety of civil society organizations from both local and global level who are currently engaged with the Secretariat and with others on global communications. The discussion drew upon activities and themes that have been carried over the last uh, year, including the Boji Bosse dialogues, uh, the Cambridge uh, Conservation Initiatives dialogues, and a variety of other ones that have taken place. The group also discussed a draft strategy, operational strategy for communication activities that's taking place this year. Uh, incidentally, that draft strategy had been put together and circulated uh, to uh, members uh, of this group. It was also circulated to the informal advisory committee for communication, education, and public awareness, uh, and also given to the Bureau for comments. Uh, the review uh, indicated that it was the basis for the start, but there was a lot more work that had to be done. Uh, that messaging needed to support the negotiations process more, building on this increased attention to biodiversity, but also be nuanced for different audiences. Uh, as a result of the review, the group decided to carry out a number of exercises that have produced some concrete results that will feed into the process. First of all, the group came up with an operational structure for coordinating activities over this year. And this operational structure does two things. Uh, it includes a strand that would be uh, following specifically the negotiations, providing awareness of what's going on in the negotiations, and providing an opportunity uh, to, to highlight what's taking place. It also had a mobilization uh, strand or strategy as well, which would be to draw upon the increased attention uh, among civil society groups uh, and others on biodiversity and mobilize this uh, awareness process to follow the process as well. The operational structure, I think I would describe it uh, as what's called a flotilla. This is a, a phrase that's been used very much for, which is to say is that there will be a number of different actors uh, both uh, we, the Secretariat, UN organizations, national bodies, uh, operating and carrying out their own activities uh, under a common flag. Uh, Flotella has one direction they head, and the direction we're heading is this successful negotiation uh, at the end of the year. And so therefore, the principle is to come up with um, uh, a structure, uh, a matrix of activities and campaigns that would fit into the structure, uh, and then uh, a way that these would be organized. Uh, detailed calendar events, drawing upon existing uh, packages such as WCMC's timeline and others was put together including strategic communications areas. Uh, and then also the group looked at a messaging matrix. The messaging matrix addressed the issue of how do we come up with top line messages that are compelling, that can be used by many different actors, uh, but these me messages that can indeed also be used in a variety of different contexts. Uh, it is noted too that during that messaging exercise, the, the linkage of the messages to the existing COP decisions and to the direction that the negotiations is heading now was a very important part of it as well. In terms of the question I think that the chair asked me right now, one of the outcomes of this meeting was a decision that while we are working now on strategically uh, managing our communications towards Kunming, uh, COP15, uh, indeed starting now we will also be building the principles for communication of this plan. As, as is indicated here, much of what needs to happen in these areas relates to behavior change. And the role of communication in carrying out behavior change is very, very important. So therefore, it's the idea of what are you communicating? Are you communicating using a variety of different strategies? Strategies that rely on rational actors, strategies that rely on connection to the heart. The group agreed that in order to have uh, a foundation for that strategy, they would be working on, uh, in, along with the Secretariat, a white paper that would investigate the ways that communication has been carried over the last 10 years. And so indeed, this feeds into the work that will be carried out uh, at SBI and at Substa on the targets. So it'll essentially be an evaluation and analysis of how target one has been carried out. A number of actors, including UNEP, uh, the Secretary and a variety of others will feed into this process and this will provide some of the guidance that will help us any future targets on communication. That will also provide us the basis for how communication can support this particular strategy. 
I believe that by the time we come to working group in Kunming in February, uh, there will be a stronger sense and an outline of what that strategy would look like and how it would feed into the negotiations and patterns that you're looking at right now. I think I've used more than three minutes. I apologize. Thank you. As, uh, as uh, we don't have any more interpretation, we've decided that we would stop the formal meeting. However, I will uh, be remain available personally and informally now, and I hope Francis can, can still be there, so happy to talk to people uh, informally. Thank you very much. Before we close, I just want to thank you all for the, uh, the comments you made. They're all very valuable. We've taken good notes, and uh, we will definitely reflect that in our work plan and in the document coming up in the future. We're looking forward to the Substa and thematic uh, discussion and looking forward to interact with every one of you. Thank you very much. Have a good day.